Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, Karen demands I leave the library because I'm homeless and I look like Santa. So, I am homeless, but no, I don't drink, and no, I'm not on anything. I'm trying to get a job, but finding employment when homeless is not an easy task. Every few days, I take a trip to the library to charge my phone and batteries so I can keep my phone on and working. I typically spend three to four hours in a quiet corner of the library glued to the power outlet charging. Today I had a cute, then frustrating interaction between a kid and their parent. I walked through the sliding doors of the library and I wandered around looking for an open chair near an outlet to sit and charge. I heard this little voice shout out in excitement and glee, Santa, and pitter patters of little boots running over to me. Now I get it, I really do. A big bearded man dressed in red with big black bags and an oversized backpack strapped over his shoulder. Any kid would easily mistake me for the big jolly man. The kid stopped dead in front of me. She was clenching her fist tight, trembling in excitement. She couldn't have been more than four years old. She looked up at me, her eyes opened wide and uttered the word, Hi Santa! That made me smile and I laughed. Her mother came running over, scooped her kid up and said sorry to me, walked away and told her kid that's not Santa. The entire interaction put a smile on my face, but here's where it went downhill. I found an open seat and plugged in to charge and do my thing. The kid and her parent were on the other side of the library, but the kid was still brimming with excitement. I could see her head poke out of the bookshelf, staring at me every so often. That went on for about half an hour. Until, I guess, the mother couldn't handle it anymore and she came over to talk to me. She asked me to leave and find a different spot because I'm distracting her daughter. I said, Hey, I'm sorry, but this is the only open space with an outlet. I need to charge my stuff. She very sarcastically said, Oh, why is that? I replied, Because I don't have one. I'm homeless. I thought that was the end of it because her face went red and she walked away. But no, she came back. She went up to the front desk to ask if there are any outlets outside and if it's okay for me to go use them instead. Seriously. She said that the library is okay with me using outlets outside to charge so I can go out there. I asked her, So you don't want me in the library, a public institution, to charge? You would rather me sit outside in the cold just because your kid thinks I'm Santa? Really? That's it? I look up at her and said, Well, ho ho ho, Merry Christmas to you. I'm going to stay right here until my batteries are charged. The lady went to the front desk and I listened in because I figured that I was in trouble and getting kicked out. She asked them to tell me to leave. They said they can't unless I'm intentionally making a disturbance, being violent or threatening. I've been here before. I keep to myself and I don't bother anyone. So yeah, I was there for four hours. I didn't move or get kicked out. My things are charged and good for the next few days. Honestly, not the worst interaction I've ever experienced, but at least she was somewhat polite. Edit. I don't think she was being malicious at all. I think in her mind, she was doing a good deed. Am I the jerk for canceling the babysitter after my wife decided not to attend my work holiday party? I'm 38 male. My work held our annual holiday party last Friday. It was held at one of those axe throwing places which I had never been to before, so I figured it would be pretty fun. My wife, who's 36, and I have three kids who are 10, 8, and 5, so we don't get to get out of the house for dates very often. The holiday party was planned almost two months ago and my wife agreed to attend with me. I suggested we make it more of a date by either going out for drinks after the party or catching a late night movie. She thought this sounded like a good idea too. I also arranged for a babysitter to come watch the kids for that night. The day of the party, my wife got home from work and told me that she had a horrible day and was in a bad space mentally, so she didn't want to come to the party. I told her I was really disappointed, but I understand if she wants to stay home. As I was getting myself ready to head to the party, I called the babysitter and canceled. I apologized to her and offered to Venmo her an hour's worth of our agreed rate, $30, to compensate for the cancellation, and she agreed that was reasonable. As I was getting ready to leave, my wife asked when the babysitter was going to get here. I kind of looked at her funny and told her I had just canceled the babysitter because she was no longer coming with me. She got mad at me and told me that I knew she had a bad day and was in a bad mental state and needed some time to herself. I told her that I had assumed none of that meant she was incapable of watching our kids and that I didn't think having the babysitter come over when my wife was still home made any sense. She told me to call her back and see if she could still come watch the kids and I told her that if she wanted to do that then she can do it 
but I'm not going to. She tried to argue with me about it, but I told her that I had to leave for the party. While I was at the party, she sent me multiple texts about how the kids were driving her nuts and that the babysitter didn't answer her calls and she needed me to come home. She kept blowing up my phone and I eventually left the party over an hour early to go home. When I got there, she kept arguing with me about how I was the jerk for canceling the babysitter when I knew she had had a rough day. I told her I wasn't going to pay a babysitter just so my wife can rest after a bad day. I told her she could have just thrown a movie on for the kids and relaxed. I told her she was the one who ruined our potential night out and that having a bad day at work is not a good enough reason to pay a babysitter $150 to $200. She still thinks I was the jerk for canceling the babysitter without talking to her first and she's still mad at me for it. But I don't think that was an unreasonable assumption to make considering the fact that there have been plenty of times when I've had a bad day and I'm still capable of watching the kids by myself while my wife leaves the house. Edit. Hey everyone, can we cool it with the purely speculative cheating angle? My wife goes to yoga class with five other moms from our neighborhood. So unless they're all stepping out on their husbands or all in cahoots together, she's not cheating. Our neighborhood isn't some reality TV show and real life isn't like that. She's an introvert and when she gets to her social limit, she doesn't want to go out. It's happened before, which is why I didn't push her to come out with me. For all the parents and or folks who aren't independently wealthy responding you're the jerk, please ask yourself this. When was the last time, after having a rough day at work, that you decided it was a good reason to spend $150 to $200 on a babysitter so you could stay home with your kids and the babysitter? Never? Then shut up. Of course OP, the person who made all the arrangements for their long-planned and much-anticipated date, canceled the babysitter because he hired her based on the fact that no parents were going to be home to watch the kids. Now that one of the kids' parents was going to stay home and never suggested they needed the help with the sitter with their own kids, why on earth would he waste $150 on this? That cash can be put towards a sitter when they are both able to go out. Not the jerk. Use my email as your spam dump? Prepare to be carpet bombed. One day, many years ago, I got an email addressed to someone who had the same first initial and last name as I do. For the purpose of this story, I'll call him G-Man. As with anyone who uses a common email address, think first initial and last name, you sometimes get an email that isn't for you. It was mostly incidental things, like receipts and the occasional personal email. I was chalking them up to being a data entry error. Perhaps they misheard the email address and instead of typing in his, they typed in mine. No big deal. In the cases where I could, I'd politely reply to the sender and let them know that I wasn't the intended recipient and to please let G-Man know that he's giving out the wrong email address going forward. It was never successful. I'd still get emails for G-Man and it was for things that I'd think you'd want to receive, like order receipts or something that had a confirmation number attached to it. I tried to track down G-Man but to no avail. There were multiple people on social media with his name so I could never 100% confirm which one he might have been. As this went on for years and years, until finally one day I got a personal email addressed to G-Man that referenced the company he worked for. Aha! Now I had something. I looked him up. It turns out that G-Man is the systems manager at said company. His LinkedIn bio says that he's an IT professional. That's interesting. I find his company email and forward him the email also advising him that the other address he's using is attached to another person and it would be great if he could be more mindful of what he's typing in or giving out. Again, I was polite in my request to him. He replied and apologized. I thought, it's finally over. But it wasn't over. Oh no, far from it. The emails I received that were addressed to G-Man actually began to increase in volume. Now I'm getting emails from mailing lists and account signups and all sorts of other crap. This guy, the so-called IT professional, is clearly using my email address as his spam dump, knowing that it went to an actual person. I would have to sort through dozens upon dozens of emails daily as a result of this, and as we all know, once you're on one mailing list, you tend to end up on a lot more of them. By now, I've decided that clearly this clown is deliberately being a jerk, so it's gloves off and game on. I decide to extract revenge at any opportunity. It started out simple enough. If I got an account sign up, I'd click the link to verify it and then promptly log in and deactivate the account. It worked for a bit, but then there would be another sign up, so I got more creative. I'd log into the account, change all the information, and most importantly, the password. 
which would leave the account active but totally inaccessible since any attempt at password recovery sent the email to my account, which was then promptly ignored and deleted. Hotel booking? I'd log on and cancel it the day before he was due to arrive. I'm guessing he never got noticed though, since it was all coming to my email. Basically, anything I could do that would inconvenience G-Man, I'd do it. This back and forth continued on for years. In fact, I still occasionally get emails for the guy. Then one day it happened. I got an email receipt for an order that G-Man had placed. It had the recipient's name and address, but more importantly, it had G-Man's address on it. I've got a golden ticket. I finally had the means of the ultimate revenge. I took his address and I signed him up for everything I could. Free samples of things that he wouldn't have any use for. Catalogs that he definitely wouldn't want. I spent an entire day finding anything I could enter his address into and filled out all of them. But the coup de grace, the cherry on top. When I was finding things to sign up for, I stumbled onto a website that allowed you to order free flooring samples. They'd be various sizes, but some are 12 by 12 squares. Carpet, tile, wood, linoleum, whatever. I signed G-Man up for every sample I could. Then I found another site offering the same thing and I did it again. And again, up until the point where I literally lost track of how many free flooring samples I signed him up for. My guess? It was easily in the hundreds if not thousands. I literally carpet bombed G-Man. Coincidentally, the email volume certainly decreased. I never heard from G-Man either. Maybe he deleted my initial email and forgot, or maybe he was buried under all those flooring samples. Either way, I'm sure once they started to arrive, he realized his mistake. I bet to this day he still gets items delivered to his address. My wife wants to name our baby after her deceased ex-boyfriend. When my wife and I met, she had broken up with her boyfriend almost a year prior. We went on a couple of dates until I noticed she slowly stopped talking to me. I found out she had gotten back with her boyfriend. We remained friendly since we would run into each other at the gym. That's how we met. A year later, they break up. I decided to go for it again and asked her out. She was pretty upfront about him and I learned that they had been on and off again for almost four years. She left him because he started mistreating her. We get married a little over a year later. A few months later, she gets pregnant. Last week, I was sitting in the kitchen studying until I heard my wife yell out, crying. I ran over to her to ask what was wrong. She had difficulty speaking, but she eventually showed me a post on Facebook that a mutual friend between her and her ex had posted. Her ex had been in a motorcycle accident and had passed. My wife was, slash is, an avid motorcyclist who stopped riding when she got pregnant. She knew how passionate he was about motorcycle riding just as much as her. I console my wife and help her get to bed, letting her know that I'm here for her. I didn't think much about the whole thing until my wife told me last night that she wants to name our baby after him. I hesitated for a bit and told her that I feel uncomfortable with it. For one, this is your ex. Second, he mistreated you. Why would you want to honor someone like that? My wife got upset and just wouldn't hear me out on my reasons. She won't talk to me at all. Am I really in the wrong here? I'm just thinking that my wife is extremely emotional at the moment since she's pregnant and trying to process his passing. Any advice? Okay, I'll be the jerk here. Is this kid yours? She left you for him before. You got married very quickly and she got pregnant shortly after. It doesn't exactly sound like she was over him given her response and wanting to name the kid after him. Not the jerk. You are absolutely correct in not wanting to have your kid named after her ex. That's an incredibly disturbing thing to have to explain which shouldn't even be an issue in the first place. I really hope she's just in a heightened emotional state right now because this is very disrespectful to you and your marriage. OP. Yes, the kid is mine. When we started dating again, her ex moved back home to another state. We moved closer to our families too, right before we got married. Update. For Easter, we already had plans with her family to go to church and then have a barbecue at her sister's. Not wanting her family to see any tension, I saw this as a chance for her to have to speak to me. As we're getting ready for church, I tell her that we need to talk about everything now. She agreed and sat down with me. I did tell her that there's absolutely no way we're naming our baby after her ex or any of our kids if we have more. She agreed and apologized for acting irrational. Also, I know a lot of you suggested that I get a paternity test. I know that I'm 100% the father. I didn't want anyone to get my anxiety up since, while it may seem rational, jumping into an extreme conclusion and making things worse. 
I thought it out, but I still did ask if she was in love with her ex still, and did she cheat? She adamantly said no. She had already stopped loving him even before they broke up. She tried to make the relationship work, but just wasn't in love with him anymore. She described him as not being a good person at all. She apologized for making me feel that way. I told her that I understand she's going through a lot of emotions right now and being pregnant doesn't help at all. But I had to ask on why she would want to name our baby after him, even after all she has told me. She started to get choked up and was shaking. I told her that she could tell me. She confessed that when her and her ex broke up, the last thing she told him was that she wished he would fall off of his bike and pass on. Also, the bike that he had been riding was one that she strongly suggested he buy, even though it wasn't his first choice. She also talked about how accidentally getting pregnant and her ex suddenly passing is a lot for her to handle. She wasn't expecting to be a mom so soon and her life is about to change when she really didn't want it to. She talked about how she thought we had travel and that she had continued racing her motorcycle. Now, she's not even sure if she'd be able to ride again. She actually thought she might be able to ride again once she had the baby, but her ex passing reminded her of how much of a risk it is. She doesn't want to risk her life when she has a family. She feels gutted. Regardless, she kept stressing out to me on how she wouldn't change a thing about her life now and that she's happy to be married to me and is going to be a mom. We're the best things that have ever happened to her. Anxiety also runs in my wife's family. My wife gets intrusive thoughts about how her ex passed too. It's so bad that she has a hard time sleeping sometimes. After discussing things, she decided that she'll be going into therapy. She has her first appointment this week. Am I the jerk for forcing a sale of my late husband and his girlfriend's home? This has caused a lot of mixed reactions, and I want an unbiased opinion. Neither me nor my late husband and his girlfriend have kids. I, 35 female, got separated from my husband, 37 male, over 10 years ago. Unfortunately, he has left me with a lot of debt to pay and in a position where I was nearly homeless. I've only stopped paying the debt off two years ago, but there's still a lot of work to improve my credit history. Because of all the stress he caused me, we never got divorced or formally separated. A matter of fact is, we never spoke after I was kicked out from the flat so his girlfriend, Anna, could move in. I was planning to file for divorce once I have enough spare income, but some events took place before I was able to do so. Now to where I can be a jerk. Two months ago, my husband passed in a freak accident. He left no will behind and has a house which is paid off with his girlfriend. He ended up having a big promotion at work. I've spoken to the lawyer, and because we never divorced or filed for separation, I am entitled to half of the house as his next of kin. Last week, I've informed Anna through a letter that I want the house to be sold. She can either buy my half or I will have to force a sale. It's up to her. I don't want to live in the house, but the money from the sale could really help out to sort out the damage done by the loans I had to pay for my ex, as well as a deposit for my own place so I don't have to live in horrible apartments due to poor credit and not having a high paying job. It will also help me to work on my qualifications so I can get a better job in retirement. However, Anna and my ex's family have called me a massive jerk, saying I have no right to the house, legally I do, and that I'm being cruel and vindictive. I've reminded them that it's not my fault that their son hasn't divorced me or had a will and said that I don't see how it's unfair as I had to pay for his debts while he lived a comfy life. So Reddit, am I the jerk? Edit, I have seen this coming up as a question a few times and don't want to keep responding with the same comment. My ex has maxed out my credit cards and took loans in my name as well as cleared our savings account to fund his relationship with Anna and some of his gambling habits at the time. Regarding the house, both Anna and my ex are on the deed and had joint mortgage from what I was told, so legally she is entitled to the other half of the house. Not the jerk. You owe nothing to her. Sell the house and be done with it. Also, stop paying his debts if they are not also your debts. By paying them, some companies can assume you're admitting to the debts as your own. They will try to get you to pay, but you should fight it if you can. And why only half? If you have no kids, shouldn't you be getting the whole house as next of kin? Am I the jerk for asking my fiancé to skip this year's Christmas family vacation because our baby is due? Context. I've gone to Florida with his family for the past five years for at least part of Christmas. Every other year, I returned before him to spend Christmas Day with my family. This year is the first time in a long time that all the other siblings are able to overlap dates. My fiancé has major fear of missing out, which is why this is a sensitive subject. His parents have always been weird about keeping their family close, 
They've never said it outright, but little things suggest they don't consider me completely part of their family yet since we aren't married. Also, my parents are away overseas dealing with a grandparent emergency. My mom has been kept in the loop though and is trying to come back as soon as she can. My fiancé and I, 31 male and 31 female, are expecting our first baby due December 30th. His family has a vacation home in Florida and they've gone every year during the holidays for about a month until after New Year. He agreed not to go this year because of the baby, but his family is insisting that he go and come back on the 28th, which is ample time before the baby is due. So he bought a ticket for December 15th through the 28th. His reasoning is that his parents really want him there and his siblings will also be going. This is bothering me a lot more than I thought because I know pregnancies are unpredictable especially in the last trimester, and if anything happens leading up to the due date, I need him there. My parents are away until December 26, and my friends have their families, so I will be completely alone. The other reason, and I guess it's more selfish, is that I will be spending Christmas by myself. It's not the main reason why I'm bothered, but it's a small part of it. He's been spending Christmas every year in Florida since he was 15, and there will be many more trips after the baby is born. I don't know why he has to go this year. Anytime I bring it up, it results in a very uncomfortable fight about my expectations to put me first rather than his parents. I don't even bring it up anymore. His parents have always been kind to me, but they also don't see any problems, so I think I'm going crazy. Am I the jerk here? Deeper context is that there was a major conflict between him and his sister-in-law last year that ruined the vacation and drove a wedge between him and his siblings. They left us out of major events, trips, etc., and they only started repairing their relationship a couple of months ago. While they are trying to fix things, they've left me out of it. They said it's a sibling matter. So I understand to a degree why he and his parents feel this trip is important to fixing his relationship with his family, but it definitely is the worst time for it. It's a sensitive topic. Update. The good news is that my mom arrived home yesterday. When I had explained everything to her, her sister, who's a retired nurse, insisted that she come too. I'm so thankful to have them here. It's hard to get my feelings across as there's a bit of a cultural barrier. My mom is from Hong Kong and without going into details, the grandparent situation was very much an emergency, but she has siblings and my dad who's staying there at the moment. As for my fiance, I scheduled a virtual appointment with him and my OBGYN to update her and told her the whole situation. Like all of you, she was appalled and strongly recommended he not travel during this time. Her words were, in my professional opinion, I'm going to very strongly recommend you reconsider your plans. In my personal opinion, I'm going to insist it. It was probably on me for not alerting her sooner regarding his travel plans. After that, he's still going, but adjusting his dates so that he'll be back on the 22nd. There will be a one-day overlap with his siblings. His mom isn't too happy he won't be there for Christmas. She suggested he fly back later on the 25th instead so that he can spend part of Christmas Day with them, but he said no. It's still not ideal for me. My mom and my aunt have insisted to speak with his parents, so we've scheduled a call with them later today. I reached out to my best friend too about this after I read some of your responses and private messages. She was livid and informed her husband that she doesn't care if it's on Christmas Day if I go into labor. She will drop everything and be there. She's also been kept up to date about who will be with me while he's away and will be visiting. I know there were a lot of questions regarding the family, but I can't address all of them. It's too much to write out. Yes, I know they don't treat me completely like family. There have always been small passive-aggressive things that bothered me. Not being invited to Mother's and Father's Day events, left out of Family Secret Santa, not being allowed to sleep in the same room with him when we visit, etc. Yes, I know that his mother must be aware that he shouldn't be leaving me at 37 weeks. She's not dumb, and I update her after my appointments, so I know she knows this too. I don't know why she's saying it's okay, but I have an idea why. My mom made it clear she will be addressing all of this in the call. Some of you have wondered how they can afford to go to Florida for a month. His parents are retired and snowbird there. His siblings and sister-in-law all have 9-5 to five jobs that are partly remote, so they're lucky enough to take their work to Florida and work there. My fiancé is a gig worker, so he dictates his own schedule. Obviously, their schedules don't always align. I haven't shown him this thread yet. At the moment, it's just one more thing I don't want to deal with him. I may in the future but I have suggested we go to therapy before we set a wedding date. He agreed. I'm also seeking counseling for myself. Also, I'm expecting a girl. Nope, this is just major red flags. 
I'm ticked off on the fact that the husband and family wanted to leave OP alone for the holidays when she's at the end of her pregnancy. Like, are you serious? This family is trash and the husband is too. I have a feeling things are going to get worse. My daughter wasted her college fund on a trip to a Comic Con. My daughter is 17 and applying for colleges. We have a college fund saved up for her that we've been adding to since she was a baby. It's a good sizable chunk of money and a lot of donations from family have gone into it as well as her own savings occasionally. We've always made it clear that the money is there for college only. She never had to put her savings in there. She has a separate savings account, but she did so anyway. Anyway, her girlfriend lives in Australia and they are both insanely big Supernatural fans. They both have wanted to go to a convention for years, at least five that I can remember. Two of the main guys are going to a convention in Australia. She begged me to let her go, and I said no, but the convention is set for after her 18th birthday. I can't stop her if she pays for it. I assumed she would use her own savings. I checked the college account to add some in, and I noticed a chunk of money missing. I went to speak to my daughter about it, and she admitted to using the money to pay for the convention. She bought herself plane tickets, her girlfriend plane tickets, it's on the other side of the country, both of their con tickets, as well as booking a hotel. The convention is three or four days long, but she's planning on staying for a couple weeks and is making a vacation out of it. All in all, she's taken about $10,000. I lost it, honestly. Demanded she cancel, which fell on deaf ears. I tried to cancel for her, but she won't be refunded everything, so I'm hesitant to do so. She's insisting that it's her money and she can do whatever she wants with it. Claims she still has enough for college and this is a once in a lifetime experience. I believe this has shown her extreme immaturity and inability to manage her future and money. I'm so incredibly angry that she would go and do this. I told her she could say goodbye to the rest of her college fund and I've locked the account. I'm now the only person with access. She said she'll pay it back, but it seems unlikely. My wife thinks I'm being harsh and that she's right. She put at least 5,000 into the account herself, so she really only took 5,000, which her mother-in-law has since said that she'll pay back. I think that would just teach her that she can pay her way out of messes. I was certain in my decision, but everyone's acting like I'm the jerk. She's a teenager and her entire life shouldn't revolve around college. I'm still uncertain, so here I am. Am I the jerk? You put the money into the fund to send your daughter to college, not to some fan convention in Australia. Now you're making sure that money doesn't help send your daughter to college. If this is your way of getting your daughter to college, it stinks. I can't help but note that you, the responsible adult, didn't set up the account with the withdrawal protections that you could have. You should have been wise enough to know that a 17-year-old with free access to that big of a pile of cash shouldn't have access to it without limits. That in no way excuses your daughter, but it does mean that you should have had more foresight into the folly that teens can do. Mother-in-law is putting herself in where she isn't needed. She needs to understand that it isn't about dollars, it's about being responsible. Not the jerk for telling your daughter that she isn't getting the money, but you would be a real idiot if you followed through with that to the extent of emptying the account, depriving yourself of the option to change your mind when you cool down and are looking at a high school graduate who needs a job. I'm going to say not the jerk, but you're really, really close. So first off, letting her place her own savings into the college account and have direct access to it was your mistake. You should never have allowed either of these to happen and the fact that you did is now greatly complicating things. Personally, I think you need to calm down and try to have a rational discussion with your daughter. She's almost 18 now and if you mess this up, then it's going to have massive repercussions for your relationship with her down the line. Yes, she messed up, but that's no reason to utterly destroy your relationship with her. I think the sensible thing to do here would be to keep the lock on the college fund account so that you and your wife can control the disbursement of funds and help her open her own account that is completely independent from you so that she can start to manage her own savings. Then the three of you need to sit down and have a rational discussion about what her college fund will and will not be used to pay for when she goes to college to set expectations. I don't know exactly how much money is in the account, but it sounds to me like she spent the entertainment portion of her college fund already. So while the college fund can be used to cover essentials in the future, tuition, books, groceries, rent, etc., there won't be any excess fund money in it. So instead of any sort of repayment schedule where she puts the money back into the fund, you'll just ruin her future by withholding all of her college fund? You'll show her who's boss by making her take out student loans that burden and drain her for the next 30 years even though it's completely unnecessary? 
and that's only if your draconian response doesn't push her to forego college entirely. Is that good fathering? You're teaching her that there is no point to trying to make good on anything that she might have done wrong. After all, there's a perfectly reasonable way out of this, and you're going nuclear for no good reason. If she was never supposed to have any discretion in use of those funds, then why did you give her access in the first place? You could have just paid the tuition to the college directly. You're the jerk. You're being way too unreasonably harsh. But if you want to be one of those parents who ends up posting woe is me on forums for parents whose kids want no contact the moment they left, you're doing great. Not the jerk. Hey bud, fellow dad here. I just wanted to add a voice of reason to this insane comment section. I'm sure I'll be torn to shreds since I'm an everyday dad like you are. We know how the media portrays us as bumbling fools and how our kids are taught to disrespect us since we need to be kept in check by our mentally superior wives and kids. All this to say, your daughter did something extremely stupid. You trusted her with access to this account because at 17 she should be responsible enough to be trusted with this. Instead, she made a horrible decision that you warned her not to. She needs to face the consequences of these actions. Reddit can threaten you all they want about her going no contact with you if she has to get student loans now. Well, if she does cut you out of her life, that's on her. Student loans are not the end of the world, they are a normal part of life for many people and mentally healthy individuals don't cut contact with mommy and daddy if they don't pay for their college. This younger generation on Reddit, so many of you are extremely entitled. You refuse to take accountability for your own actions. We have an entire generation right now who are shocked that they have to pay their student loans back now. Let the taxpayers do it. Why should I have to pay for the college education I chose to get student loans for? Why should I be held accountable for my actions? As a taxpayer, and also as someone who has paid off both me and my wife's student loans, I sincerely hope this generation stops complaining and seeing themselves as victims, but I'm sad to say that I just don't see that happening anytime soon. The funny part is, that's how you become successful in life. You have to take accountability for yourself and your own success. But none of them will ever understand that and they'll just continue to be jealous and bitter of the bad guys like landlords, investors, and high-level executives. You think any of these successful individuals got to where they are by complaining about how unfair the world is? How they are victims? I can already hear your response. No, they got there from nepotism. They were trust fund babies, and mommy and daddy gave them everything. Oh, please, get out of here with your excuses. I grew up in a trailer park in one of the poorest parts of Mississippi. I came from nothing, and I'm now a self-made millionaire. Most of my friends are self-made millionaires who also started with nothing. But your generation had it so much easier. I'm 34 years old, probably not much older than most of you are. The difference is that I never had this losing mentality that most of you self-identify with. I never saw myself as a victim and never made excuses for why I couldn't achieve my goals if I worked hard enough. But go ahead and disregard everything I've just said. I know you Redditors will come up with 100 different reasons why I'm an idiot who has no idea what I'm talking about. Why am I not surprised to see that last dude got massively downvoted? Because we've been reading these stories every day for the past 5 years and we know exactly how the people on Reddit think? Am I the jerk for insisting my friend's significant other pay their share for holiday accommodation? My friend, male 47, and I, 43 female, booked to go to an island we'd both been keen to go to. We booked a two-bed cabin, and because of the popularity of the place, we had to book and pay 10 months in advance. We split the cost 50-50. Two months before we're due to go, he meets someone, and they commence dating. The holiday comes up, and understandably, she was a bit uncomfortable with him coming with me. I was given an ultimatum. Either she comes, or the entire holiday is called off. I didn't say yes immediately, because I needed to check with the accommodation, as the island has a limited number of guests allowed and I needed the okay from them first. My hesitation wasn't taken well. They thought I wasn't keen. I got back to them within 24 hours and said I'd gotten the all clear for the girlfriend to also come, and she could book plane tickets for her. A week later, he informed me that she had the tickets, and I asked him if we could discuss rebalancing the accommodation costs now that there were three of us going, as it should now be a three-way split. I was surprised that he responded with anger. As far as he was concerned, the accommodation was paid for, and it was wrong and greedy of me to expect money from his girlfriend. He told me that he was paying for the entire holiday for his girlfriend, so it was still going to be just him and me paying, so it was unfair of me to not pay for half. I told him that there's three adults, three people, three-way split. 
If he chose to pay for his girlfriend's third, that was his choice and nothing to do with me. He told me his girlfriend was going to buy me a cocktail to say thank you for the accommodation, but if I was going to insist on a split, then I could forget it and buy my own darn cocktails, as he couldn't believe I was being so selfish. The thing is, a cocktail is $15, and I was currently covering half her accommodation costs, about $600. I don't think I was the jerk for asking her and them to cover her share of the accommodation. I hadn't even met her yet, but they thought I should cover her costs because it was already paid for. Am I the jerk for insisting she pay for her component of the cost? Not the jerk. Is it too late to get a refund on anything? I wouldn't want to spend a single second with them considering they're treating you like trash for asking for a simple contribution on a trip that the new girlfriend has weaseled her way into. I would bet my bottom dollar that she either can't afford and is insecure or she's just that entitled. If he's paying her whole trip, then he needs to cough up more for this day. Bad friend. OP. I'm super tempted to throw it all in. Demands have started about removing myself from the cabin to give them privacy and canceling pre-booked plans because she doesn't want to do them. Update. Thank you everyone. Interesting to see various lines of thoughts. It seems there's a split between people that think everyone pays equally no matter what, those that think a couple sharing a bedroom are treated as one person cost-wise, and those with other ideas as well. With this in mind, and everyone else going on, I called the accommodation and discussed options, then called my friend. I explained to him that we'd make the arrangement to split everything equally when there was only two of us going, but I no longer felt that agreement was fair. I suggested the third option, splitting the cost of the communal areas three ways, but set cost per bedroom, and also stated that any food, activities, etc. wouldn't be split anymore. We'd each be responsible for our own, and they could decide as a couple how they were paying for themselves. It didn't go down well at all. He didn't see why he should be out of pocket because I decided to go against our agreement that I'm paying half of everything. I stuck to it and said I'd be willing to negotiate the accommodation costs, but there was no way I was going to pay half for his girlfriend's activities or her dinners and drinks, and it was ridiculous for him to think I should be paying half of his girlfriend's costs, especially since she's a complete stranger, and he had already asked me to change all of our previous plans to suit her. He called me names and told me I was acting crazy. I stopped him and said that from that, I don't think this holiday is going to work and I had spoken to the accommodation and I was going to cancel as of today. I told him if he still wanted to go, then the accommodation would hold open the booking for him for 72 hours and if he confirmed with them, I'd instructed them to hold on to $1,800 as what he had contributed to the booking and refund me the rest and his girlfriend and him would have to pay the hotel to finalize. If they didn't confirm, I'd get the refund for the whole amount and then forward him his share. He went quiet, then told me that since I was changing the rules at the last minute, I should leave the entire accommodation payment because it wasn't his fault that I no longer wanted to go, leaving them in the lurch and I would be ruining his holiday with his girlfriend. I told him I was canceling and I would definitely not be paying for any accommodation I wouldn't be using. I might have been a little petty when I told him he'd still be paying for his girlfriend's costs, It'll just be a little bit more than he was expecting because I was no longer going to subsidize them. I canceled my flights and the accommodation and emailed him all of the details. Wow, I'm so sorry. They both are immature. I bet you she's young. Offering a cocktail and then taking it back? She's young or broke or cheap. Not someone you want to go on a nice trip with. I would say, since there are so many requests by her, this has become a trip more about her and therefore needs to be split three ways. How is it fair she gets to kick me out of the cabin? Sadly, you may lose a friend over this. He's obviously siding with his two-minute jealous girlfriend over a long-term friend. OP. She's 51, so the oldest. I don't know her at all. Never met her, so can't say whether she's cheap or broke. Who is this guy to you? How did you meet him? How long have you known him? I can't fathom someone expecting this from someone else. It sounds like an oblivious, self-centered sibling taking advantage of a family bond type of entitlement. This can't have been the first time he's done something like this. OP. I've known him for five years as a friend. Yes, I've had some issues with him for lack of empathy regarding others and some general selfishness. He was a mid-40s guy that basically never had a long-term girlfriend. I just sort of went with the too used to doing his own way to pay much attention to it. We have traveled together before and in larger groups. I've had issues in the past with his lack of planning, leaving a lot up to me, but his entire personality seemed to change overnight when he started seeing this new girlfriend. Nothing was good enough before he'd at least discuss things, 
Talk options. This time was like hitting a brick wall. His way or no way. Decided this was what was going to happen without talking to me and then got angry when I wanted to discuss it first. Update. I haven't kept in contact with them for obvious reasons, but through some mutual type of friends, I found out the following. They planned to go, but tried to find cheaper accommodation on the island, so let the hold expire without making any contact with the accommodation. From my understanding, everything was booked up completely that weekend and for the next six months. They lost the option to use the cabin, and someone else immediately booked it when it became free. There's a wait list. I received back the full deposit and immediately transferred his portion to him, as I stated I would. Never got an acknowledgement he received it, but it was an account I had paid into previously, and my bank assured me it was good. A mutual friend told me the ex-friend was upset, as against my advice, he had bought non-refundable and non-transferable plane tickets and refused to buy travel insurance, so he's out the cost of those fares, about $3,200, and that because I pulled out of this, his holiday with his girlfriend was totally ruined, and I owe him an apology and the cost of the fares. Not going to happen. Myself, I've booked a holiday back at the island where I am in a single apartment by myself and plan to have an awesome time. My boyfriend, we're both 22, won't give me back my Dyson hairdryer. My boyfriend and I are in a long distance relationship and I visited him in Europe seven months ago. Since I'm in the US, my current Dyson hairdryer doesn't work in Asian and European countries. So when I was there, I tried other methods and eventually just purchased one there. I think it was about 600 to $700 for a hairdryer. I don't remember exactly, basically a lot of money. But my reasoning was, I'm going to always travel and I'll definitely be using this a lot. When I left, I had to buy an extra suitcase because of all the things I bought, 80% my mom's things. So I asked him if he could bring my Dyson when he visits me next time. He said sure. I asked if he was absolutely sure because it's pretty bulky and if he doesn't think he can, I'll make it fit somehow. He assured me he will bring it to me so I trusted him. He visited me in the summer and I reminded him countless times before to not forget it. Well, he forgot it. He has two houses a couple of hours away from each other and left it at one of them, so he said it's not his fault because how was he supposed to bring it? I was obviously annoyed, but I said fine, I'll get it when I visit him next time. His whole family moved to Asia a month ago, so I reminded him to bring my Dyson. He said okay, but he didn't, and asked how he was supposed to move it with all his stuff. He said he'll have his mom, who's still in Europe, send it to me or bring it. Well, I'm flying to him next week and I've been telling him either have his mom bring it when she goes to Asia or send it ASAP, please, because I've been traveling without it and I got it solely for traveling. He said his mom forgot and it's not his fault, but he will ask his cousin to send it to me. Am I crazy for being upset over a hairdryer? It's not the biggest inconvenience, but also it's not just about the hairdryer. I'm just extremely annoyed he's this irresponsible over someone else's belongings, especially if it's that expensive and he has the audacity to act like none of it is his control. I am also insecure about my hair, and it often affects my mood when I go out, when I don't have it styled. I don't feel good. I wanted to feel pretty when I'm visiting him. It is 100% on me for leaving it there, but I also don't feel like it was unreasonable to trust your boyfriend with your things. I also feel like I prepare so much for him all the time, and he doesn't show the same effort. Edit. Dyson hair dryers cannot be used with adapters or converters. I don't know a single person who has successfully done so without frying it. He knows how much it costs because we debated together whether I should get it and he was also with me when I purchased it. Also, we've been dating for one and a half years and I honestly don't think he's the type to sell it. He probably doesn't even know how to sell it. He's the most clueless person I know. If anything, maybe he lost it, but he swears he didn't and that he'll just send it to me, but I probably won't have it by the time I visit him. I just feel like, why didn't he just send it before then? For now, he said he will send a photo of his cousin holding it by tomorrow. I feel like the crazy girlfriend. Are you sure he still has it? Sounds like he does not or has given it to someone else. OP. Honestly, no. He could have lost it, I guess, but he swears he didn't. I wouldn't have been this mad if he was just honest about it, but it's the fact that he refuses to even acknowledge he had so many chances to give it to me and failed each time. He says sorry, but he always just says that without meaning it. There's something he's not telling you. He broke it or lost it or gave it away. He's just stalling and hoping you'll magically forget about it and stop asking. Whether you can get the truth out of him or not, I think he owes you a new hairdryer. So by your own description, he's clueless, lazy, dismissive, 
and doesn't follow through on his promises. Sounds like a keeper. Yep, and she can't find any men like that in the US. Seriously, like girl, if your type is lying losers, just get on Tinder. Homegrown and no travel required. I imagine there's lots of guys on Tinder who aren't losers. Your problem is that you probably swipe left on all of them. Whoa, Karen, I didn't know you ever used Tinder. Oh, relax, Reddit boy, it was years before we met. Am I the jerk for ruining my daughter's graduation? Plus, four years later update. My daughter and I have been estranged for about five years now and have recently reconnected and are working on, slowly, repairing our relationship. As part of this, she's been airing out various grievances she's been holding against me all these years that she doesn't think holding on to them is conducive to a healthy relationship. A lot of these things are petty teenage grievances I can't believe she hasn't let go of yet. But one of them stuck out to me. I mentioned it to my husband and he expressed disbelief and disappointment in me for my actions at the time. I maintained that I didn't do anything wrong, but his reaction has me curious. Her email to me about the situation. My graduation was another thing. I don't know if you remember, but you refused to let grandma come, even though I told you how much I wanted her to be there because of how she had supported me through uni. When I told you I invited her, you said you wouldn't come if she was there, so I had to disinvite her by lying about there being a limit on tickets per person. As if that wasn't bad enough, you and daddy refused to sit with each other, take pictures with me, or even go out for a celebratory meal afterwards. I have one picture from my graduation, one, and it wasn't even the professional one. It was just one my friend took on her phone of me. I don't think you and dad dealt with your split very well at all in regards to your kids, but it really hurt me that you, the both of you, would be so selfish about that. I just wanted one afternoon. For background, I'm estranged from my own mother and have split up with her father. She says it was selfish of me not to allow my mother to attend her graduation or to spend extra time with her father, but I think it was selfish of her to ask that of me. It's bad enough that she continues to keep in contact with her grandmother when I asked her not to. Anyway, I want to know if I really was the jerk here. Edit. Though I disagree that my feelings weren't even worthy of consideration in the situation, would it not have been best if asked me for compromise? For example, I would attend the graduation and she could have celebratory meal with her father and grandmother separately afterwards. But I can see here that the overwhelming consensus is that, in this instance, I was the jerk to my daughter. Fine, I'll apologize again. Update. Quite frankly, I'm really embarrassed and ashamed to reread my original post. My attitude was terrible and it's one of those moments I wish I could go back in time and shake some sense into my past self. As many people in the comments predicted, I no longer have a relationship of any kind with my daughter or two of my other kids. Lockdowns did a number on our family, I'll just say that. I've been doing a lot of reflecting and therapy over the last year and I realize I've not been the kind of mother my kids have needed in their lives. I have no contact with my daughter now, who is married and moved abroad now. And from her wishes, this will not be changing anytime soon. I also have very little contact with two of my other kids. My relationship with my final kid is strained and I'm doing everything I can not to break it. After having logged into this account again and seeing that post, I find myself desperately wishing to go back in time and maybe I could have stopped the breaking of my family if I had behaved differently here. I don't really know what I want to say here. Maybe just hopefully encourage one person who has been deemed the jerk to reflect sooner rather than later and maybe their lives won't go down the same direction mine has. Am I the jerk for not letting daughter control thermostat? Context. We're from the UK. I'm struggling to see why we're the jerks as deemed by my parents and sister. My husband uses Reddit and thought this sub would provide a third insight into what we're missing. My husband, 42 male, and I, 40 female, have two daughters, Jane who's 22 and Lisa who's 5. This concerns Jane who's been struggling with the cold. Jane started to complain about the temperature of the house, now that it's no longer summertime. Currently, we leave the central heating off all the time apart from in the early morning, 5 to 7 a.m., so Lisa doesn't get too cold when she's awake. My husband and I don't have an issue with the temperature of the house. It's approximately 16 Celsius at night across all of the bedrooms since we checked, in case her room was draftier. We don't really feel it, and we do not see where Jane is coming from. Jane complains and says she wears multiple layers to bed and around the house while we are all asleep. So, she asked if she could have access to the thermostat in order to switch the heating on at a higher temperature than 18 Celsius, which is what we set it to. She wants to raise it to 21 Celsius, but we said no. 
She keeps complaining about how she has to wear four layers to bed so she doesn't feel cold in the morning. Lisa says it isn't cold when we ask her. My husband and I also don't feel the cold, so we said no to her asking and thought that would be the end of it. It was not. We had dinner at my parents' house in which Jane was making comments about how warm and toasty her grandparents' house is. My parents were shocked that we didn't allow her access to the thermostat and they tried to sway us into giving her access because it isn't right for her to sleep in multiple layers. My sister also agreed with them and said my daughter has valid points since the temperature is starting to drop in the night. Are we wrong here? You're the jerk. 16 Celsius, 60 Fahrenheit, or even 18 Celsius, 64 Fahrenheit is too cold for most folks. Just because you're fine doesn't mean it's reasonable to expect her to be miserably freezing. I see that you're not interested in keeping the heat on consistently either, so that's miserable for her as well. Why do you think she should suffer so you can save a few dollars on the power bill? Also, the things most folks are suggesting, heating blankets, space heaters, etc., actually use more electricity than just keeping your home at a comfortable and consistent temperature. Expecting her to have four plus layers to be moderately warm is unreasonable. You're the jerk. Get her a personal space heater for her room or a heated blanket or a heating pad. She obviously is not making it up that she's cold. Who are you to tell someone that they're not cold? I do understand not giving control of the thermostat to her, but to not make accommodations for her so she isn't cold is where you're the jerk. Also, 16 degrees Celsius is cold. And yes, this dumb American did have to Google how much that is, which is about 61 degrees Fahrenheit. My fiancé is angry that I bought my own daughter five pairs of running shoes. My fiancé has three kids with her ex, while I only have one kid with my ex, my daughter who's 14. My daughter is a state qualifying cross country and track runner. This means that her training schedule is rather intense, with her weekly mileage reaching into the high 70s and low 80s. At her most recent sports physical, I asked her doctor how often I should be replacing her running shoes because I'm sure they get worn out very quickly with the amount of miles that she runs each week. Her doctor recommended switching the shoes out every six months, as well as getting two pairs of shoes so we can switch out the pair she's wearing every other day or so. However, her shoes may need to get replaced earlier depending on how intense her weeks get. After the appointment, I took my daughter out to a few athletic stores so she could pick out a few pairs of shoes. I told her to pick out four pairs of running shoes, two for track season and two for cross country. Then I told her to pick out a pair of spikes for her races. I spent over $300 for her shoes. When we came home, my fiance saw the bags my daughter was holding and my daughter excitedly told her about the new shoes she had gotten. My fiance stayed quiet until later that night while we were getting ready for bed and she started yelling at me for being irresponsible and a horrible person to her own kids. She said that she was very mad because I should also get her kids shoes if I'm spending over $300 for my daughter. I mentioned that we agreed we would each provide for our own kids on our own, and her kids don't play any sports. They all sit in their rooms all day on their electronics. Even when I try to buy them something, they never say thank you or appreciate what I get them. She got even angrier, and now she hasn't talked to me still. It's been two weeks. How do I handle her anger towards me for not getting her kids shoes when I got my daughter's shoes? Gee, I got an idea for you. How about you break up with her, dude? Running shoes for track are not a gift. They're school supplies. If she played hockey, would the fiancé yell at you about the pads and gear? I'm just blown away that he got four pairs of running shoes for only $300. Am I the jerk for telling my family that they never cared about my birthday before? Why should it matter now? I'm 18, female. My parents divorced when I was about six. It was a 50-50 custody split, with my mom wasting no time to get remarried to my stepdad. My stepdad had kids already. Alex, 15 male, Violet, 16 female, and Mabel, 17 female. I was relentlessly bullied by them for various things I couldn't control. Having a speech impediment, having less expensive clothes, only being able to see my dad on weekends, etc. My mom and stepdad didn't do anything to stop it and essentially told me, kids will be kids, then kept it pushing. My mom would lightly scold Violet and Mabel if they ended up hurting me while we were playing, but wouldn't do anything more. I had to watch as they got far more expensive gifts for birthdays and Christmas and actually what they wanted from their wish list, while I got the bare minimum of necessities and would only get something I actually wanted from my dad, but he could only go so far due to making two times less what my stepdad makes. I appreciated it nonetheless. I didn't even get to properly enjoy my cake 
because my step-siblings ate it all before I could even get seconds. I was never allowed a party because my friends were too messy and loud. Around age 10, I pretty much stopped expecting them to put effort into my birthday and I just kind of let it pass by whenever I was with them. Yesterday was my 18th birthday and I decided to spend it with my friends, boyfriend, and my dad. I was pretty much out all day and came back at around nearly 10 p.m. My mom was waiting for me with my stepdad and pretty much blew up on me for not spending the day with them. Apparently, they prepared a small celebration for me that got wasted because I wasn't there. They were both going off on me for being inconsiderate and ungrateful. In the middle of their little rant, I just snapped that they never cared about my birthday all these years. Why should this one matter now? They were in shock and that gave me an opportunity to go to my room and sleep. I woke up to texts from my grandparents and aunt saying I was disrespectful for saying that and ungrateful for anything my mom and stepdad did for me. Edit. Just to be clear, I put my step-siblings' current ages within the post, not the ages when they were bullying me. It made sense to me when I made this post, but I understand how it could be confusing. Your stepdad probably told your mom that she was responsible for you and he wouldn't provide anything extra. Meanwhile, she was probably reaping the child support benefits off your dad so he couldn't afford to buy anything extra special for you. You are 18 now. Just move in with your dad if you can. You should also write down your feelings and leave it for your mom and stepdad to read. I doubt they will give you a chance to say it all face to face. Not the jerk. Also, that's pretty much what happened with me and my stepdad, except my stepdad wouldn't let my mom get a job because he wanted a housewife, and the only money my mom received was child support from my dad, which she promptly used on my older siblings. I was the only one that still lived at home at the time. After I moved out and started living on my own, Christmas gatherings were always still majorly disproportionate. Step-siblings would get at least $1,000 in items, if not more. I might get $50 to $100, maybe. I was grateful for what I got, but can't say it still didn't sting a little. Then he later on gifted me a $10,000 car, and my step-siblings were mad. They got gifted houses. That he gave me anything like that. I never actually resented my stepdad, to be honest. I just resented my mom a little for putting me in that position. Like, couldn't she have had separate Christmas gift opening sessions? I don't know. As far as my father goes, well, I grew up wishing my mom would finally divorce him so I didn't have to live with him anymore, if that answers that question. Probably why I never really resented my stepdad. Am I the jerk for not preparing my pregnant wife food? My wife is five months pregnant and has started to feel hungry a lot. She's recovering from throwing up constantly and now it's just once or twice a week. We both work from home. I try to do the majority of household chores cooking, dishes, laundry, cleaning, breakfast, lunch, dinner, etc. Though it's a small apartment and no kids, so it's not really much work. And we typically just have milk and bread for breakfast, which I bring to her in bed. She helps with cooking whenever she's feeling good, and very lately she started to cook more than me. Otherwise, I cook the dinner with often some assistance from her, cutting onions, etc. We save the dinner for lunch next day. It goes well most of the time. The problem is that my wife keeps complaining to me that she's hungry and I haven't fed her. I do offer snacks like bananas, fruits, and nuts, but she says she's looking for some real food because she's really hungry. When I ask her, what do you want me to make, she often doesn't have an answer and tells me she doesn't know, but she's hungry. If I offer to make something, say soup or boiled potatoes, she shoots it down for one reason or the other. It's carbs and not good. It's too light and she's too hungry, etc. This gets me visibly frustrated. Today, she agreed to a serving of watermelon, which I cut and served. While cutting it, I asked her to tell me what she wants to eat because she will start complaining in a while that she's hungry and I can't immediately have something ready to eat because it takes preparation. She said she's good for a while and didn't entertain my question. As predicted, when I visited her room in an hour or so after work, she started pouting that she's hungry and I didn't feed her anything since lunch throughout the day. This made me a bit angry because I did feed her the melon and some dry snacks. It just wasn't a proper food. Moreover, I had asked her what she wanted to eat for this very reason, and she had refused to answer then. I told her she's expecting too much from me, both figuring out what to make and to make it. I asked her to at least take responsibility for figuring out what she wants to eat and letting me know in advance. She felt like I was invalidating her and then said, Okay, won't tell you anything from now on, pouting. I got annoyed and I left the room. Am I the jerk? Make freezer meals or your own frozen meals. OP. Oh, she refuses to eat anything remotely unhealthy. 
That includes takeout, let alone frozen meals. So unfortunately, frozen cooked food is a no-go. Thanks for suggestions, though. Everyone sucks here, because it sounds like neither of you is eating real food. OP. Dinner with rice, plus veggies and lentils or meat. Same thing for lunch the next day. Fruits and dry fruits. Milk and bread or cereal for breakfast, and sometimes eggs. Is this not good? We both have pretty small appetites. Well, at least it used to be. I'm glad to have made the post. It was an outlet for my frustrations, which helped me become calm again. I also learned that our diet is likely inadequate, so having a conversation with wife regarding that. I get to learn some different perspectives, also a good thing. I now got motivation to make some meals unasked and see how it goes. All in all, making this post was useful. I agree it's not a big conflict that often gets posted here, but it's still a conflict where I'm unsure if I'm doing anything wrong. Nevertheless, glad to have posted. Update. First things first, I feel I may have unintentionally cast my wife in a somewhat unfair light. She's far from being lazy, pampered, or a princess of some sort. She's on her feet a lot, grabbing her own snacks, sipping water, and even tossing together some rice for our lunch now and then. She's really quite the team player around the house, always ready to lend a hand when she's feeling good. I often find myself encouraging her to kick back and rest. The real pickle here wasn't about her helping out or not, but about her leaning on me to sort out all of her meals. Reading your comments, I had a bit of an aha moment. She genuinely didn't know what she felt like eating. And to be totally transparent, this food decision deadlock isn't a new game for us. Pre-pregnancy, we had often volley the, no, you decide, ball until one of us gave in. Now that we've got a baby on the way, I've realized it would be quite irresponsible for both of us to let her go hungry because she can't decide. While technically her responsibility to decide, I've taken it upon myself the following advice here. Overall, I think this is making her feel that I care about her diet and her and our relationship has improved. I also feel pretty good about our diet now. In a nutshell, we're making progress, she seems more at ease with our meal situation, and I'm feeling pretty good about getting our nutrition on track. I really don't get this post. I understand that their nutrition is lacking and she needs to eat better for the baby, but the post reads as if he's providing meals for a kid who can't make these decisions on their own. She's a grown woman who can make her own nutritional decisions, then execute them. Why can she not make her own meals? Why is she lying in bed and whining about OP not feeding her and expecting him to know what she feels like eating? Why is this his responsibility to read her mind and ensure she's fed? I really can't fathom why OP's wife is blaming him for this. And for her to say that he's invalidating her? How? By asking her to use words and tell him what she wants to eat? Her response of, fine, I won't tell you anything anymore, was incredibly immature. He was asking an adult to decide for themselves what they want to eat, and that's her response? As someone who's been pregnant and thrown up throughout her entire pregnancy, I would never have considered telling my husband to figure out what I want to eat. My husband is much like OP and often brought me snacks and cooked food, but I was still responsible for making food decisions for myself because I'm an adult. OP caring about her diet is one thing, but darn was she acting like a helpless kid. Expecting someone to be my personal nutritionist and chef is just way out of line. At the end of the day, it's great he helped her get right on track, but her diet is her responsibility. Am I the jerk for leaving my husband for him and his parents' rude behavior? I, 25 female, have been married to my husband, who's 24 male, for four years. The first two years of our marriage, we were stationed in North Carolina, but we have since moved to Texas where his family lives. Since moving to Texas, I've gotten to know my in-laws, and what I know is that they are all disrespectful. All of them, almost as if it's hereditary. Here's a few examples. I'm Korean, and my husband's family is Hispanic. My sister-in-law tried bulgogi, which is beef marinated in a sweet sauce, and she actually gagged in front of me when she took a bite out of it, spitting it out and complained that she didn't expect it to taste like that. Every time we go out to eat, my in-laws will run the waiters back and forth asking for special requests and refills, but if they don't like the food or they forget one item that they ordered, they will literally tip the waiter change from our pockets. I'm talking $5 on a $120 bill, even if their service was amazing. If we go into a store or go to the gym and it's about to close, they will be the last people to leave. And not last, as in they close at 9 p.m. and they're leaving at 9 p.m. Last, as in they close at 9 p.m. and we're barely walking out the door at 9.15 p.m. Every time an instance like this happens, my husband and I get into it. They usually end with my husband making excuses like that's just the way that his family is, or he doesn't care what other people think and neither should I. 
My last straw was when my mother was unexpectedly diagnosed with cancer. I flew back to my home in Korea to take care of her for a while when she was getting her chemo. I stayed for two weeks before needing to go back to my home in Texas for work obligations, and can you guess who never once reached out to me the whole time I was there? Yep, my in-laws. Not once did I receive any call or text message, not even when I came back did the topic of my mom come up. My husband told me that he told them about my mom, so I don't understand why no one could have just checked up on me or at least called my mom. The next time we saw my in-laws was the next day I came back from Korea. They were over for dinner. I waited to see what they were going to talk about, then as they continued discussing what cows they wanted to buy, I left to the room and didn't come out for the rest of the night. When they left, my husband angrily confronted me, telling me how disrespectful I was. I honestly didn't even have it in me to fight anymore. I just packed my bags and booked the next flight to Korea. All my husband's and in-law's messages are being ignored now because I just cannot stand their disrespectful behavior, and to hear my husband calling me disrespectful was enough. Maybe I'm overreacting, but honestly, this behavior is exhausting. I deal with it every time we go out, and I'm done. I don't want to be surrounded by people like this, and I'd rather focus my attention on my mom. Am I the jerk? Update. To clear things up a little, the situation happened over a month ago, and I've been in Korea ever since. My husband and I did not get divorced, but we had talked things out and decided I needed space to take care of my mom first, and whatever problems that we had can be discussed at a better time. As for my in-laws, I haven't spoken to them since. I really wanted to work things out after reading a few of the comments saying my in-law's behavior is not the fault of my husband. I thought that maybe I was being too judgy over behavior that I'm not used to. That maybe they're not all bad, but they just have a few faults. As for my mom, she hasn't been doing so well. She's been losing a lot of weight because she says that everything she eats tastes like metal and she's been in constant pain. It's gotten so bad that she can't even get out of bed by herself. On top of that, I'm having a tough time watching my mom struggling and feeling like I don't have anyone on my side during this time, especially since my husband's family still hasn't reached out to me. Last week, my husband reached out to me, telling me that his mom had tonsillitis and was going in for surgery. Reluctantly, I reached out to her and told her that I would be praying and wishing her a safe surgery. I even had the hospital's gift shop send flowers up to her room because I couldn't be there. I figured that maybe they just weren't the type of people to reach out and that I should put whatever happened in the past. My husband expressed how grateful she was and how happy she was to have received the flowers, hoping that I was doing okay in Korea. Unfortunately, I wasn't. Fast forward a week later, my mother's condition had gotten so bad that she lost her battle and passed away. I told my husband what happened and he was in just as much shock as I was. He said that he was sorry, telling me how much of a good mother she was and how happy she must have been to have me by her side during her last few days. We were preparing to get the funeral done in the next few days, so I asked my husband what day he could be here. He was hesitant on the phone, saying that he felt bad for my mother and all, but he also had his mother to worry about, how he needed to be there for her just like I was here for mine. I was in complete shock and just hung up the phone. He's missing my mother's funeral so he can take care of his mom who has tonsillitis. A week ago. Unbelievable. Any chances I ever thought of giving him were completely out the window. It was insane to believe that he felt like his mom recovering from a very minor surgery was more important than the passing of my mom and his mother-in-law. I'm not saying that tonsillectomy isn't important, but I'm sure she'll recover just fine as it's a very common surgery and the downtime is one to two weeks and it's already been a week. As for now, I've hired a lawyer to discuss divorce and I'm going to therapy. I plan on going back to the US to end things with my husband, quit my job, and take my stuff back with me after my mom's funeral. As for his family, I haven't heard from them. Shocking, right? Whatever. I'm just glad to be done with him and his family and that I'll be able to focus on myself and my mental health. Just found out I'm disinherited. I, 35 female, just found out that my sibling and I are cut out of my parents' will. They have millions and plan on leaving it all to charity. My brother and I both pretty much live paycheck to paycheck. Let me be clear, we are in regular contact and we have a good relationship, maybe not as good as I thought. I'm doing EMDR therapy right now for some issues with how my mom has contributed to me feeling like love is conditional based on my weight and appearance. My dad has a history of severe rage episodes that had me constantly on edge. Honestly, I'm glad they're in good financial spot as they age and I don't have to worry about having money to help them in their old age. My dad has a family history of dementia and may need to be in a home or require at-home nursing care one day. 
However, my mom remarked to my brother that us kids are getting nothing as they plan on leaving millions to charity. That means that over the rest of their lives, they plan on hoarding their wealth and not spending it on themselves. I've previously told them I hope they spend their money while they are alive. They don't plan on doing this apparently. They plan on continuing to live well below their means and having millions left over when they pass. I know I'm not entitled to their money. It's not mine. If they had nothing to give me, I'd be okay with having nothing. Recently, however, they keep bringing up their net worth to me, which I've been confused as why. I feel like I was never good enough. My parents have said through actions, little digs, and outright, your father and I are really disappointed in you, that I'm a failure. Both of us are single without kids. I'm single because I haven't found my person, not because I'm actively not wanting a relationship. My mom is really disappointed about not being a grandma. I'm hurt and I feel like this is going to be their final way of saying they aren't proud of us. I'm happy for them to leave something to charity, but like, all of it? Millions? I really feel like a huge jerk for being upset about this. We are politically on the same side. They aren't super religious and they don't believe I'm going to heck or anything like that. I'm just kind of shocked and confused. I don't know how to navigate my feelings about this and would love some outside perspective. On the one hand, I feel like they're sending me a hurtful message. On the other hand, I don't want to feel disappointed or hurt because it's not my money and I know that they don't owe me anything. Edit. OMG, I was not expecting this response. Since I don't have a partner, I have no one to lean on. I reached out to a longtime friend and she politely put up a boundary that she cannot support me through this because she has other things going on in her life. I feel like I'm being dumped by everyone I care about, so it's nice to get some support, even if it's from internet strangers. It sounds like they're going for some kind of reaction. You can just keep responding with something like, I'm glad you're in good financial shape. Given dad's family history of dementia, he may need to be in a home or require at-home nursing care one day. Probably not what they want to be thinking about, but if their attempt at needling you results in you reminding them of their impending frailty, they might shut up about it. Just remember, OP, you're good enough, and you deserve kinder parents. Do I need to worry about my boyfriend's friendship with his professor? My boyfriend, 24 male, became friends with his former professor, 25 female, sometime last year. I don't know what to make of it. They seem to be friendly and talk consistently every week, and from what he tells me, it's usually very surface level. Sometime last year, after the course ended, my boyfriend, his professor, and some of his male classmates went somewhere to eat together. My boyfriend brought up that he was going to be attending an event, a plastic modeling show, and his professor showed interest and invited herself to the event and asked if she could stay at his Airbnb with his friends. My boyfriend and his friends were all okay with it. I unfortunately couldn't attend the event, but from what my boyfriend told me, he and a few of his friends met up at the Airbnb. That same day, his professor comes to my boyfriend's Airbnb and tagged a few of her girlfriends along. I believe they all stayed in the same place. The next day, they go to the event, went to a bar afterwards and got drinks. A lot of them, except my boyfriend, got pretty drunk and my boyfriend took the liberty of being the designated driver for his professor and her friends. His professor won some model kit from the event and even in her drunken state, asked my boyfriend if he could stay up with her to work on the kit together. From what my boyfriend tells me, nothing else happened that night. After the event, everyone from that group created a group chat and they continued to plan and talk about future events together. Since then, my boyfriend and his friends have met up with Professor and got to meet his professor's fiance at an anime convention and it sounded like they all got along well. His professor continues to express interest in other events and it sounds like she may be attending another event with my boyfriend and his friends in the near future. I trust my boyfriend and don't think he's hiding anything from me. Honestly speaking, I think it's hard for me to understand their friendship as it's his professor. I've had a conversation with him on this and he let me know that I have nothing to worry about. I would like to hear others' opinions and see what y'all think of this friendship. Is this something I need to be concerned about or is it really nothing? You should go to one of these events with him. OP. I do struggle with social anxiety so it makes me uncomfortable to be sharing a space with a lot of unknown people. I'm hoping to go to the next event though since it's local. Her relationship with students is very unprofessional. OP, I'm totally with you. I'm also quite confused at her choice of friends. I'm not sure why of all places does she choose to share an Airbnb with her former student and to be drinking with them. She's classified as an adjunct facility, so she is a professor but is part-time. She works full-time as an accountant. The whole situation just feels weird to me. You say his professor. 
What is their specific academic connection? She taught him once years ago and now they're roughly equals and friends? Or she's his primary support for a PhD or what? OP. The first option. She taught him last year and now they're friends. He's no longer in a course with her. I totally understand how it's possible for students and their professors to be friendly, but I've never heard or seen of a friendship where you consistently talk and hang out together so casually. So she's no longer his professor. They're two adults of the same age and power level. OP. It kind of gives me the same vibes like if a student graduated high school and is friends with their young teacher. Obviously not the same, but a student-teacher relationship is there. I think as a teacher, you should still uphold that level of professionalism and mentorship, even if you're no longer the student's teacher. I also want to note that they are technically not equals, since they're both in relationships. She can't be acting however she wants with former students. Update. My boyfriend and I had a more heart-to-heart -heart talk regarding his teacher, and he recognizes that it crossed some of my boundaries. He believes that she may be behaving this way she does, because when she hangs out with her fiancé's friends, she gets bored with them and may possibly be seeking attention from others. Several weeks later, my boyfriend had a conversation with his college instructor regarding their friendship and told her how I didn't feel comfortable with their friendship and how he thinks they should keep communication at a minimum. She brought up how she understands because her fiancé also had an issue with how she chose to share an Airbnb with my boyfriend. She mentions to my boyfriend that she sees him as a brother and that's why she feels really comfortable with him, but that she will try to respect my boyfriend's wishes of keeping conversations at a minimum. Well, even after that talk, she continues to still message my boyfriend weekly on random life updates. And because she's also part of my boyfriend's chat and Discord, one of his friends invited her to attend another plastic modeling show. It occurred recently, and dinner. Since she accepted the invitations, I chose to attend as well so that I could personally meet her. The dinner occurred first and it was very uncomfortable because she practically ignored me the entire night. When she joined us at the table, she greeted my boyfriend but didn't say anything to me. Even my boyfriend noticed and got annoyed, but then introduced us. She got increasingly drunk throughout the night and was saying random stuff about my boyfriend to his friends like, He could have been the best student in my class, but it's because he missed some assignment. And, He gave me a five-star review on Rate My Professor. She ended up not going to the show, but my boyfriend had a chat with his guys, and they told him that they want to respect my feelings too and make it a guy's night next time. I would like to hear others' opinions and see if you also think she's acting suspicious. She wants to hook up with your boyfriend. She's crossing major boundaries. Has he stopped conversation with her? OP. I wouldn't be surprised if that is her intention because there's definitely some shady people out there. I agree. She is crossing some professional and personal boundaries and I think it's quite unusual behavior for any teacher to act like that. Yes, he has stopped communicating with her. She was consistently messaging him until last week. So, hopefully she got the memo. The fact that she ignored the girlfriend all night after meeting her says it all. When I meet a friend's girlfriend for the first time, I make sure to make her feel included and welcome. This woman very obviously has some other motives, and I don't usually jump to that conclusion. My Karen sister keeps having babies that she can't afford. I'm 27, female, and my sister, who's 29, never wanted to get married. She just doesn't like the marriage thing. Nothing wrong with that. But she still wanted to have kids, so she had a baby with her long-term boyfriend. Well, her boyfriend doesn't do anything to help her. He doesn't work. He gets disability. His issue has long since resolved, but he still collects somehow. So he pays for some bills, but not much. He doesn't help with housework, and he barely helps her with their now one-and-a-half-year-old. He just plays video games all day. I've seen it when I come over to babysit. My sister works from home, so she will be on a wireless headset having a conference call with the baby on her hip while she's cleaning the kitchen and her boyfriend will be playing video games in the living room. And that's the situation every time I come over and my sister tells me that that's what it's always like. I work full-time as a nurse, so I come over to help when I can, but I also work third shift and my sister lives almost two hours away, so it's hard for me to help a lot. She's gotten mad at me several times for not helping babysit enough. I had a two-week vacation last winter and she got mad at me for not babysitting a whole lot while I was on vacation. I want to help out because I love her and my niece, but I work a lot too and the drive is long and I'm just tired a lot. Well, two weeks ago we were talking and she told me that she and her boyfriend were going to try for another baby soon. Oh no. We're going to try for another baby soon. And if things work out, they were hoping to have another baby by next Thanksgiving. I said to her, are you sure it's a good idea to have a second baby when your boyfriend barely helps you with the first one? 
it just blurted out of my mouth. She got all defensive and tried to tell me that he does help some, but I reminded her that she tells me all the time how he doesn't help, and I've seen for myself how he just plays video games while she does everything. She got really mad and said, well, maybe if you helped more, then it wouldn't seem like everything is on my shoulders. After some back and forth arguing, I got up and left. She told our mom what I said, and our mom got all mad at me, saying I was a jerk for upsetting my sister, and my brother got onto me about it too. I don't think I was a jerk though. I'm not so sure at this point. We live in a world where when you state the obvious, people get upset with you about it. Not the jerk. Generally, my stance is that only the people having the kids get to decide if and when to procreate. But since she feels entitled to your time and effort as a babysitter as part of her childcare plans, you get to put in your two cents. Reach back out and say, I'm sorry that I did not react well to your plans for another baby. That's a decision between you and your boyfriend, and I should not have provided unsolicited advice. However, I want to make clear that if my participation as a babysitter for your kids is being factored into your decision, consider this fair warning that I will not babysit for you again if you have a second kid. Whether or not you have kids is your choice, whether or not I help care for them is mine. I will be present in your kids' lives if you want me to be, but not in a caregiving role. Not the jerk. How does she have more anger reserved for you, who lives two hours away, than for her deadbeat boyfriend? You need to take yourself completely out of the picture. Do not help this ungrateful person with anything anymore, and just ignore these tantrums. Maybe if you helped her more, then it wouldn't seem like everything is on her shoulders? Tough love time. It's supposed to be on your shoulders. You and your partner, not mine. You will be taking care of your kid by yourself from here on out. Then if you want another baby, knock yourself out. Not the jerk. And immediately stop supporting her. She's using you. And she's not going to get it unless she figures it out for herself. It's a mercy to her for you to stop providing for her. She needs to learn. You're the jerk. This isn't your call. But you don't have to be an enabler either. You've created a scenario where the true impact of her decisions, having a baby and dealing with a useless boyfriend, really had low consequences because you were always there. Stop it. Apologize and say it really isn't your call and you were wrong to weigh in and be judgmental. From now on, be very busy with your life and see your niece occasionally. Your sister needs to see how her life really is rather than the way that you've made it for her. Remember, no more babysitting. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her sister? Please let us know. Never stay with a deadbeat and definitely don't have kids with them. It really is a bad idea to make a government employee angry. This one is a double government employee event and what you should know is that if you get the attention of a government employee and make them angry, that they will make your life miserable. The setup is that I was working for a local county government in the permitting department that handled drainage and floodplain enforcement. I received a complaint from a homeowner, a nice guy, lived next door to a house that was part of an incorporated village, not a nice guy. Nice guy lived in an unincorporated portion of the county and hence the call to me as an agent of the county. I drove out to the site and to investigate and I discovered some interesting facts. The permitting agent for the village allowed the incorporated homeowner to fill his lot affecting the drainage which caused the unincorporated lot to flood every time there was anything more than a little rain. Nice Guy indicated that there was some tension between him and the not nice guy and part of the issue was that Nice Guy and his partner were a gay couple. This ran up a red flag for me but in trying to be impartial I took the information and some photos for the file and indicated that I would contact the village to find a resolution. I wrote a letter and then called the village inspector, Jack Wagon, to discuss. I was told by Jack Wagon that the village could do as it pleased and that I could do nothing to stop not nice guy from doing as they pleased as it was approved by the village. There was then a comment about the type of people making complaints just to cause trouble. I was now on the case and it was time to make sure everything done on the incorporated lot was 100% legal. At this point, the game certainly was now on because if there's one thing that grinds my gears, it's bullying. I went back out and spoke to Nice Guy to let them know what I was up to and also that I was not going to let this slide. I then started investigating the elevations on the two lots and what fill had been placed on the incorporated lot. The not nice guy came out and started getting belligerent about my presence and ongoing investigation. He incorrectly stated that I did not have jurisdiction over his lot and that he would be calling the police. I patiently listened and then pulled out my two-way radio and requested that the home base dispatch both a village and a county police unit to the location. 
I then indicated that since there was a regulatory floodplain on his lot, I did in fact have jurisdiction and that I would be exercising my right to determine the impact of his fill activities upon that floodplain. Both of the police units showed up and I let them know what was going on. They were both appropriately agitated to have to waste their time and let not nice guy know that I was within my authority to proceed with the investigation. A little while later, while I was measuring things, Jack Wagon showed up. He started berating me about harassing the villager resident and threatening calling my boss and filing a complaint and so forth. I invited him to do so, quoting which parts of the code he should indicate I was violating. I was using marking point to show the limits of the floodplain for the photos for the file, and what do you know, Jack Wagon's shoe got painted when he tried to stop me. Obviously, he was even more angry, as was the homeowner, due to very bright orange paint in the grass in his yard. I pointed out I had done the same on the neighbor's lots, but they just kept complaining. It was actually marking chalk that comes off pretty easily. Interestingly, I found two really wrong things on Not Nice Guy's lot. One, there was fill placed in the floodplain. And two, a garden shed was built on the fill and partially within the floodplain. Both are a big no-no and are actually against federal law. So the course of action had two parts. One, make the incorporated homeowner remove the fill and shed from the floodplain. And two, let nice guy place fill in their lot outside of the floodplain to counteract the fill remaining in not nice guy's lot outside of the floodplain. I also told nice guy it would be a good idea to run a field tile on their side to drain the water that would inevitably pond up between the two lots when it rained. Predictably, not nice guy and jack wagon got super angry when I sent the letter out that there were violations that either had to be corrected, remove the fill in the shed, or apply a revision of the floodplain with the Army Corps of Engineers. Good luck with that. This then led to a meeting at the county office with not nice guy, jack wagon, my supervisor, and myself. Quickly, things went to 11, and there was yelling by jack wagon about abuse of power, etc. The department head came into the conference room and told them both they were wrong and that they should leave peacefully and comply or face the consequences, the fines. The best part was that not nice guy had to apply for a permit and guess who was the one to review and approve it? That's right, yours truly. Now, I was following the letter of the law, but you have to know that poor government workers are underpaid and overworked. Strangely, the permit for nice guy was almost immediately approved, while not nice guy had to have a very thorough review to ensure it was correct. You could make a case I was abusing my power, but I can assure you that the timing for their review was well within acceptable limits. Also, how could I be held to account that they misfiled three times before they finally got it right? Generally, if you behaved like a civil human and came to the office, we would help you get things done properly so the permit would go through first time. But not nice guy decided he could do it all on his own, so it took him three times. Had he come to the office, I would have given him the same service as others, but he decided to take the hard route, and therefore I didn't give a single inch when it came to the submission being perfectly correct. Ultimately, the situation was resolved, but it took a lot more effort than it should have. Moral of the story, don't be an entitled jerk. My Karen aunt demands that I pay her $300 Olive Garden bill. I'll start off with saying that I have an aunt on my dad's side of the family. She's 50 and has five kids, ranging from age 20 all the way to 12. She's always been known to be a freeloader and taking advantage of situations and people. One time, me and my dad were planning on going to the drive-in and my dad stupidly told her. She asked if her kids could be included too. I felt upset because this happened every time me and my dad had something fun planned, just me and him. I'm hoping that you get the idea with what I've given you so far. But anyway, last week I wanted to celebrate my little sister for getting her driver's permit and I invited all of our family to go to Olive Garden. By that, I mean all of us who live in the same house. I told everyone to clear their schedules for Friday afternoon because I didn't want anyone to feel left out. Well, that's where I messed up because my dad told my aunt and told her that she could tag along too without telling me. We showed up to Olive Garden at around 4.30 p.m. and I asked for a table for five. Me, my dad, my two sisters, and my grandpa. But my dad said that if they could make it a table for 12, I asked why, and that's when he told me. I was ticked, especially because my aunt and my little sister have history, but I didn't think much of it because I wasn't expecting what was coming up. We're seated, and around 30 minutes later, she shows up with all of her kids. 
We eventually order, and she kept ordering expensive dishes and lots of drinks. I was kind of in awe, considering she lives off of food stamps, which I don't shame anyone who does, but she kept ordering like she was Scrooge McDuck on just another Tuesday. The bill eventually comes, and I ask for it to be split. She says, in such a grating voice, What do you mean, split the bill? I thought you were paying for us. That's when it clicked. She only came for the free food. I immediately glared at my dad, who started blaming me, saying, Why would you offer to pay, and then not follow through with it? Maybe because I wasn't expecting to pay for another six people. I ended up asking the waitress how much it would be because I didn't want to ruin the mood and my little sister's accomplishment. The bill came out to $557.87. Excluding what me and my family, my dad, my two sisters, and my grandpa ate, it would be about $243. I outright refused to pay for her and her kids' meals. I felt as because two of them are still kids because I never invited her myself, let alone agreed to pay for her bill. Now my dad is calling me a jerk because he had to pay for it with his credit card. I don't believe I did anything wrong, but that's the reason I'm here. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. I don't know what's wrong with your dad. He knew you didn't invite her and her kids. He invited them so he can pay for them. OP, that's exactly what I told him. I didn't want to make a scene, which took a lot in me to not do. And she also managed to finesse my dad to let her keep my leftovers. We don't have any food at home. Not the jerk, and I think you and your dad need to have a sit down and a very long conversation about this. OP, we've had plenty. He lets her borrow tons of money, and even when he's struggling financially, but never had money for child support. He orders her and her kids pizza while my mom had to bust her tail selling her clothes to be able to buy us a rotisserie chicken. I told him he lets himself be treated as a doormat, but all he ever says is, She's my sister, dude. I can't just say no. Which I understand, but when is it enough? I found out my family is hiding my fiancé's affair with my best friend. I, 22 female, need some serious advice on how to navigate this. I found out a week ago that basically my entire family has been helping my fiancé, male 23, hide his affair with my best friend, 23 female. I created this account because I honestly have no one else to go to, so my brain figured internet strangers would be best. None of my family and friends have read it, thank the stars. For extra emotional context, my fiancé and I have been together since we were in the 8th grade, on and off until 2020. We have Richard, my half-brother who's 26, Maria, my half-sister, 27, Angie, my mom who's 56, Peach, my best friend, soon-to-be ex-best friend, and Alex, my fiancé, soon-to-be ex. So a week ago, Alex was taking a shower and he had left his phone on our bed. Both me and my fiancé have an open phone policy, seeing as we both struggled with being cheated on in past relationships. Go figure, seeing my situation. I was packing my suitcase for a family trip that's happening after my rehearsal dinner tomorrow. I heard his phone keep going off. He yelled from our shower if I could mute his phone. I went to go get his phone and I saw that it was Peach calling him. I was curious at first, but seeing as she's part of my bridal party, I didn't find it too suspicious. I muted the phone and soon messaged Peach from my own phone. Here's the paraphrase of our conversation. Me. Hey Peach, my fiancé is in the shower right now. What did you need? Peach. Oh, nothing. I just wanted to confirm with him the flowers for your bouquet and aisle. Me. That's weird. I didn't change my mind on any flowers or anything. The florist was contacted last month and everything was paid for already by Tony. Tony is my mom's husband. Peach. Are you sure? I remember him telling me you changed your mind. After that, it was the usual wedding talk after that point. In hindsight, I should have found it very weird that she would call him about six times to confirm a flower choice when she simply could have either texted me or Alex. When Alex got out of the shower, I told him Peach tried calling him about the flowers. I asked him what made him think I changed my mind on the flowers for the wedding. He paused for a bit. I now know he was basically stalling and doing the, oh, I'm thinking face when I asked him. He then said that he thought I had mentioned it in passing during a dinner. I told him that I didn't recall that. He then just shrugged and grabbed his phone and went back into the bathroom. I hate to be one of those people, but for once, my gut actually sunk. I got this really paranoid feeling and I couldn't shake it. I tried to convince myself that it was just my old cheating trauma trying to creep back, yet I just couldn't let this go. Me and Alex had dinner and I pushed through all the way until it was time to go to bed. I pretended to fall asleep first. Me and Alex usually cuddle to fall asleep. 
When I knew he was in a deep enough sleep, I went to check his phone again. I checked his Instagram, Snapchat, and messages, and I couldn't find anything. I then went to his Facebook Messenger. He had Messenger to communicate with his family overseas. I only saw his main family, and most of the messages were about getting plane tickets to come to the wedding. We were supposed to get married in December with a Winter Wonderland-themed wedding. However, with my previous relationships, I checked his archives on Messenger. That's when the horrific truth came to light. There was a group chat with Peach, Alex, Richard, Angie, and Maria. The group chat was established a year ago, where basically Alex and Peach confessed to having an affair to my family. My mom did shame them at first, yet she later asked Alex if he truly loved Peach. Because you can't help who you love. Yeah, great mom. That was super helpful. He said he was absolutely sure, and that he also loved me too. Then Maria and Richard offered that he, being Alex, bring up to me having an open relationship. They both are in open relationships and married, and apparently it's working well for them, and whatever la-la land they live in. At this point, me and him were already engaged. Alex mentioned to them that it seemed too far deep to try and bring it up. Angie, my mom, even though at this point I hate to even call her that, said that they would cover for Alex and Peach until he felt strong enough to bring up an open relationship to me. As I was reading, all I could think was, how the heck could my family betray me like that? How could Peach betray me like that? We've been friends since kindergarten. We even grew up with Alex. How could she process in her mind to hook up with my fiancé and say that she loves him too? All of this in this disgusting group chat. For Alex to have the nerve to say he loves me as well? For him to know firsthand what it's like to be betrayed like this? I honestly wanted to throw up. However, I was just taking screenshots after screenshots. The more I read down, I found out that Peach took my spot on our previous family trip. I got a really bad stomach bug a while ago that caused me to not go. I can't even begin to imagine what they did on that trip. And the fact my mother was okay with all of this, I think that's what hurts me the most. The fact that she's known for a whole year that my fiancé was cheating on me. That's taking the longest to sit in, I feel. There's even more in the group chat, but these were the major points. I've known for a whole week now. It's been eating me up inside, and I want to explode and go off on all of them. I want to ruin their lives the way they ruined mine. It all hurts so much, and I just really want advice on how to confront them. How do I even begin? What do I say? The anger I feel is so intense that I feel like if I just let it all out, I would look like I'm insane. Please Reddit, anything would help. I'm planning on confronting them tomorrow at our rehearsal dinner. Common questions for my messages. Why are you having the rehearsal dinner this early? Me and Alex agreed on three rehearsal dinners, one for my family and friends, one for when his family and friends are in town, and the last one with our families combined. Does Alex live with me? Yes, I bought the apartment while he was living with his roommates in his dorm. I let him move in because he and his roommates weren't getting along after some friend drama they had. We've been living together for two years now. His name is not on the lease, I've done some slight research, and I will definitely use this to my advantage. We have a cat, but after all this, she's staying with me, and I'll fight him tooth and nail for her. My relationship with my mom? It's turmoil and stillness at best. After the emotional and mental trouble she put me through most of my childhood, when I turned 18, she apologized. I thought she was actually sorry, and we were working towards rebuilding a bond. With all of this, I'm not even sure we ever had one to begin with. I'm her affair baby, as I've been called. My mother is a very religious person, and she figured that if she confessed, then she would be saved and redeemed. The opposite happened, and she was kicked out of her church group. Anyone that lives in a small town knows that gossip runs wild. Tony, my mom's husband, forgave her and decided to move to better help their image, I guess. A Redditor pointed out that this incident may be why she hates me. Yet, I can't comprehend how this would be my fault, or why she would even hold on to that grudge for so long. Who paid for the wedding? The wedding was a group effort between myself, Alex, stepdad, aunt, and cousin. My mom handled more of the diplomatic things, invitations, and our gift registry, really. Hopefully, this is enough extra information for some folks. I appreciate it all. I'm going to bed soon to prep for tomorrow. I know it will be a long and emotional day. But I know with your guys' support, I'll do fine. I'm hoping I will at least. Update. So I did wind up taking bits and pieces of advice from everyone. Last night, I constantly was going back and forth between going ghost or full-on exploding on everyone. I decided to go a mix of both routes. I sent the screenshots to Alex's parents and explained the whole thing to them. I was honestly expecting them to ignore it or not believe me. 
However, they called rather quickly. They asked me if I had any hard proof of them cheating besides their confession. I confided in them that I did not. They asked for more screenshots, and I just basically sent them a good chunk of the screenshots. His mother made me feel so awful for sending them. She was sobbing and apologizing for her son. She soon became inconsolable. His father took the phone and asked was there anything his son could do to make it up to me. This early morning, I was offended he asked that. Yet, I saw it from his perspective later. I asked him if I could be frank, and he agreed. I told him that unless his son could shrivel up and disappear, then there wasn't anything he could really say. His father said that he understood. I asked him if they could keep this to themselves until I brought it up to Alex. They said they could, and we ended the call. For a while, I thought throwing up from stress was rare, but it finally happened. Alex heard me, I guess, when I was throwing up, not when I was on the phone. I had stepped outside for the phone call, because he woke up and tried to rub my back. I held my hand up and I cleaned myself. This is around 7 a.m. in the morning. Alex had concern in his voice and asked if I was okay. For once, I actually saw nothing but red, yet I kept my composure. I have no idea why, but I guess that will be my superpower I'll hold on to. I ignored him and just went back to sleep. I woke up at 8 a.m. to start getting ready for the rehearsal dinner. Alex told me he had to get some things done before heading to the restaurant. I told him that was fine and that I'd see him later. Before he left, he said he loved me and this was one of the days he was excited for. I said me too, trying not to have much rage behind it. Once he left, I gathered all of the screenshots. For some people that don't know, you can schedule text messages to be sent out at a certain time. I decided to do this to send it to everyone. Peach's family, our friend groups, his family, as well as mine. I sent it to go at 1.25 p.m. This would be the halfway point of the dinner and people would be dropping off gifts early for us, etc. I gathered the black hole of stress forming in me and headed to the restaurant where it was time. My mother and her husband were already there. My mother hugged me and all I could do was stand there. I did a quick tap hug so she wouldn't get suspicious and we headed inside. Guests started flowing in and everyone was surprisingly on time, besides my grandparents, but they moved slow so I didn't blame them. Once everyone was gathered, Alex went on this whole spiel of how he was so happy everyone could come and that he was excited for his family for the next dinner was supposed to be November 20th. He mentioned how I was the love of his life and how he was so happy our families would mingle and we would be one. I wanted to ask him how dare he say that, but nothing but fake smiles and nods came from me. Peach was basically looking like a clueless dog and smiling right along and clapping for us. To see this happen in real life was truly mind-boggling. The lengths people will go to to have their cake and eat it too. I could barely eat as the stress was getting to me so badly. At the time I said for the messages, people's phones started buzzing and Alex's and Peach's phones were blowing up. I would like to admit that for once, a genuine smile crept on my face. It was like watching an entire kingdom crumble and fall. The horrified faces of Peach and Alex when they looked at me was golden. It's the one highlight I will hold on to from this emotional day. My aunt went ballistic. She started calling my mom a cruel heartless jerk over and over. My mother hurriedly checked her phone and saw that I sent her the screenshots too. She started screaming and becoming irate, saying I was really trying to ruin her life again. As some of you suggested, she still apparently is upset about being caught having an affair and being shunned. My grandparents' reaction hurt her the most because they started screaming at her. My grandmother was trying, with a few of our other guests, to hold my aunt back as she started screaming everything she could. My grandfather was screaming at my mother that he didn't raise her to be like this. At this point, everyone is in screaming and crying hysterics. My other bridesmaids were going off on Peach. I hate to admit it again, but I took great joy in that. My grandfather went on to screaming at Alex. I just started laughing and sobbing. I had so much emotions that I genuinely think my body didn't know what to do anymore. The tears just kept coming. My cousin escorted me outside as fast as she could with Alex chasing us down. He kept screaming my name and begging to talk. Like most of you suggested, he wanted to talk to explain his side. I ignored him and my cousin was pushing him away from her car so that she could get in and drive off. She took me to my aunt's house and told me to stay there and not answer the door for anyone. I didn't and just sat on the floor. That's when I just started bawling. All the emotions I've been kept up for a week, they finally came out. After about another hour, my aunt and my cousin came back home. They hugged me for a good five minutes straight. My aunt caught me up on everything. Apparently after my cousin drove off with me, 
Alex came back in and started screaming at Peach for ruining everything. They got into a screaming match and some of our friends were trying to split them apart. My grandparents, aunt, and Tony, my mom's husband, were drilling into my mother for answers. Tony was the most livid. Apparently, during the family trip I couldn't go to, my mom told Tony that I had offered my ticket to Peach so she could enjoy a nice break for herself. Tony at this point was screaming and reading some of her messages out loud. She was begging him to stop and saying she could explain. My aunt started adding on that she better start explaining because all she sees is a worthless mother and a vile person. Apparently, this set my mother off and she started screaming about how she hated me, about how I ruined her life and made it difficult. How she felt like she could never be happy because I was always a constant reminder of her biggest mistake ever and she regretted having me. That set my aunt off and she basically pounced on her. For context, my aunt is infertile. In her words, I was the daughter she never got to have. So in her mind, she went full mama bear mode on my birth giver. That's what I'm calling her now. My aunt has been more of a mother to me than my mother ever has been in the past 22 years of my life. To make a long list short here, here's everything that happened. Tony is divorcing my mom. He's had suspicions for a few months that she's cheating again. Peach exposed Alex's text to her that the reason he was hooking up with her was because he felt I was growing distant a while back. I was putting in overtime at work to save up for his birthday and that he was lonely and didn't know how to bring it up to me. Peach's father spammed her with calls and will be cutting her off financially. Apparently, this is my fault and I'm an evil jerk for ruining her according to her texts. My mother has been on a tirade with our family, exclaiming I'm an evil person for destroying her world again. Should have thought about that before condoning anything. Half-siblings felt it wasn't their place to say anything to me, and that I should have expected Alex to look elsewhere because humans aren't monogamous, and people love who they love. Same old, same old. A lot more has happened, but to avoid my brain from imploding on itself from the stress and anger, it's finally out in the air. I've been getting texts and calls from everyone, but at the moment, I've left my phone in the other room. I'm updating this from my aunt's computer. My aunt offered for me to stay with her until I get back out of this jumbled mess. I accepted it, saying as I have no intention of going back to that apartment. I've already emailed my landlord and will be handling it all next week. My boss emailed me back and said I was allowed to use some paid time off for as long as I need. I will definitely take it, saying as I'm highly considering moving somewhere else quiet and peaceful. I'm thinking maybe Iowa, or maybe even North Carolina. I've heard they have good cost of living in those states. Am I the jerk for telling my sister-in-law she's no longer invited to our house? I, female 27, and my husband, male 27, got married a year back. We had been dating for 10 years, and most of his family knew about us. I went to his sister's wedding because I was invited, and it was a nice experience. I've grown up to be very social and career-oriented and really value education. My husband is the same, and that's how we really connected with each other. My sister-in-law, however, has a different mindset. She got married at a very young age and chose to have a family. She has one daughter and chose to not pursue a college degree. However, she's a total brat and has always been told yes for everything. For context, she had a three-day wedding in Italy with 120 guests. She doesn't hate me, but doesn't love me either, and the feelings are mutual. We just don't connect. We recently bought a new house and threw a housewarming for all of his family and everyone loved the house. We have an extra guest bedroom, just in case. His sister absolutely loved the house, which she said like 50 times, and said she would move some of her daughter's stuff here, in the extra room, because we have too much space and she doesn't want to carry it whenever she comes. We live in New York and she comes from New Mexico. I really didn't get the logic and politely declined and said we have a lot of guests coming every now and then and we don't have spare space for your daughter's clothes or toys. She wasn't happy, but I didn't care. It's been four months since we bought the house, and she's come a total of 53 days. Yes, I counted. Most of the time, she comes unannounced and says, I was visiting someone, or I was in the neighborhood. What kind of person would fly from New Mexico to New York to be in the neighborhood? Anyway, slowly I realized she had started putting up pictures and redecorating our guest bedroom, and I lost it. I told my husband and he said I'm overthinking and she's just trying to be friends with me. When she left last week, I packed a box of all of her belongings, which she very conveniently forgets, in our guest bedroom and I shipped it to her place. She got very angry and called me and started screaming at me. I told her to stop overreacting and stop considering our house as hers and that she's no longer welcome. I told my husband everything and that I would not entertain her anymore. 
He agreed to what I said and told his sister that she needs to stop doing this or she's no longer welcome. She called my in-laws and literally every person we know and told them that we were being jerks. Our phones have been buzzing with texts and calls saying how inconsiderate we are and that what we did was wrong. I told everyone, if you're so interested, keep her in your house and stop bothering me. Am I the jerk? Edit. I see a lot of people writing that she's running from a bad husband. She's not. She got married at 17 because she was pregnant with her daughter and got divorced three years later. She lives with her parents in a five-bedroom townhouse with no job. She loves the idea of living in New York. I think shipping her stuff that she forgot was brilliant. Not the jerk, because her showing up without advance notice isn't okay, but you and your spouse should probably chat and get on the same page for boundaries with the family. My mother-in-law photoshopped my husband's nose on our wedding pictures. How do I tell him? I, 27 female, have been with my husband, who's 29, male, for 7 years. I remember that early in our relationship, one of the first things he expressed insecurity about was his nose, specifically about its width. He never wanted surgery, but thinks his nose is too big for his face. I never thought that true, and for a long time, I wondered where he had gotten that idea from. Then I met his mother, and all my doubts went out the window. I don't hate her, but the woman complains about everything, and she seems particularly interested in criticizing her sons. Barely anything about my husband or his older brother is good enough for her, and if it is, she's quick to imply that they don't deserve it. According to my brother-in-law, that behavior didn't start until father-in-law passed away, about eight years ago, so they don't usually hold it against her. But to me, it seems like she legitimately doesn't want her kids to be happy. Most times we talk to her, my husband ends up devastated. She constantly complains about me, his job, our apartment, and his appearance. She has, on more than one occasion, suggested that he get a nose job. That tends to upset him, so I always try to shut that down as quickly as possible. We got married in early May. The photos were ready in about two months later, and we created a shared album on Google Photos for our friends and family, including mother-in-law. I got pregnant during our honeymoon, and I'm now 24 weeks along. We've had problems with mother-in-law concerning my pregnancy. We're having a boy, and she had a breakdown because she wanted a girl, and that forced us to put her on an info diet. This was two months ago, and she has since improved her behavior. Because of that, we said yes when she invited us to go to a mall near her place to shop for baby clothes last Saturday. My husband had an emergency at work and ended up not coming along, but we still managed to have a good time. When we were done, she invited me back to her place. I hadn't been there in a while, and I quickly saw that she had gotten some of our wedding pictures up on the wall. I instantly noticed something was wrong with them, but I couldn't pinpoint what it was yet. Mother-in-law saw what I was looking at, and proudly announced that she had gotten someone to fix his nose. In other words, she gave her son a Photoshop nose job on his wedding pictures. I couldn't believe it. I never thought that she'd stoop so low. It wasn't even a good nose job. It was so bad that my husband's face didn't look real. He looked like a Ken doll, and not in the hot Ryan Gosling way. Mother-in-law must have seen how mad I got because she instantly tried to defend herself. She tried to make the point that her son deserved to look his best on his wedding day and I should have convinced him to get the real nose job before our ceremony. I made up an excuse to leave, but I could tell that she knew the real reason. She's been calling and texting me almost every day since. I've been ignoring her, but she's always either apologizing, accusing me of overreacting, or begging me not to tell my husband. I know it seems trivial, but I'm outraged, and the more I think about it, the more disgusted I get. I could never imagine doing something like that to my kid. I haven't told my husband yet, mostly because we've both been busy with work this week, but also because I have no idea how to. His mother was finally starting to be a better person around him and his brother, and I know it will break his heart to find out about this. I don't know what to do. I have to tell him, but I can't figure out how. I know he loves his mother, and I don't want to damage whatever relationship they still have. Mother-in-law also mentioned she intended to send the improved pictures to some of her relatives, so I have to find a way to shut that down. So how can I tell my husband his mother photoshopped his face on our wedding pictures? More importantly, what would be the most peaceful way to do it? I would suggest that you sit your husband down and say that something came up when you were out with his mom that you need to tell him about. Tell him that you went back to her place and saw she had printed up wedding photos, but that she had photoshopped his face to change his appearance. Keep it short and don't beat around the bush. Then just be supportive and let him react however he's going to. 
I really don't understand why his mom would tell you not to say anything. Does she not realize that at some point he'd see the pictures himself? OP, I don't get it either. I've spoken to a couple of friends about it, and so far our best theory is that she didn't think the Photoshop was that obvious until I was able to point it out. That still barely makes any sense, and I have no idea what she was thinking. Am I the jerk for telling my wife that if she's not home in 10 minutes, I'm taking her dog to the pound? My wife, who's 29, and I, 33 male, have been married for 4 years now. I'm the sole breadwinner and she stays at home. For the majority of these 4 years, my wife has wanted a dog. I absolutely despise dogs. I was attacked by one when I was a teenager and I still have scars from it. About 6 months ago, my wife adopted a shelter dog without giving me any notice. I got home one day to find a dog staring at me. I legitimately thought that the dog had just wandered in when the door was open or something, but my wife came and explained the situation, that we had a new family member. This dog has obvious mental and emotional problems. These problems are so bad that if you leave it alone for more than 30 minutes, he'll start destroying furniture. I know this because that's exactly what happened the last time we left it alone for more than 30 minutes. It destroyed the upholstery on a $4,000 sofa. After that happened, my wife promised to take care of it. Due to the nature of my job, I'm often away for work. Occasionally, these work trips involve sitting around and twiddling my thumbs. Other times, 20-hour days every day. My most recent trip was a two-week marathon of the latter. I was in a foreign country where workers' rights aren't exactly taken seriously. I got home this morning. After a 12-hour flight, I walked in the door at about 5 a.m. My wife was still asleep. I went straight to bed in the guest room as she's a light sleeper and I didn't want to wake her up. A few hours later, I heard her getting ready. I woke up to greet her and she told me that she was going out for the day. I asked where and she said she had a spa day planned. Problems. 1. I was insanely sleep deprived and stressed out. 2. I was going to have to watch the dog all day. I told her no. She responded by telling me that she hadn't been able to get her nails and hair done for two weeks because of my trip and she had to watch the dog the whole time. I told her, tough luck, but I wasn't going to watch a dog all day in my state. She literally ran out the door, waving goodbye to me, got in her car, and left. At first, the dog and I had a little staring contest until he started barking at me for some reason. Then I got an idea, and since my wife was only a few minutes away, I sent her a text. Hey babe, if you're not home in 10 minutes, your dog is going to the pound. I was fully ready to follow through, but my wife read my text, turned around and came home. She then spent the following 20 minutes shrieking and has been in a foul mood since. Did I do anything wrong here? Please rehome the poor dog. You hate it and your wife sounds like she isn't mature enough to care for a dog, never mind a rescue with emotional problems. That dog is going to have a really bad life with you and it deserves better. I'm going to have to go with not the jerk on this situation though. Your wife shouldn't have brought a dog into the home knowing how you feel about them. Not a jerk. What your wife did was a psycho move in my opinion. Whoever decides to get a pet against the wishes of their partner is an immediate jerk. You would have been well within your right to rehome that dog immediately and it should be rehomed, whether it's the best for the dog or not. It's not your job to make this dog's life better and if your wife thinks it's her job to make this dog's life better or save it over your well-being, she's delusional and suffers a pretty bad case of main character syndrome. However, as a word of caution, don't stare dogs straight in the eyes unless you're established as their superior. It's a confrontation, and while dogs don't usually get physical over staring contests, they show signs of aggression if you're not familiar with them or on friendly terms. I don't say this to judge you, just as a hint for things you can do to avoid scenarios like the one that led to your rehoming idea. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for choosing my budget over my boyfriend this Halloween? I, 28 female, own my house and my boyfriend, who's 29, moved in in January. We had a ton of early money arguments and agreed that we would keep to a household budget. Also, he agreed to pay down his credit card debt. I have more flexibility in my personal spending than he does. Early after we moved in, my boyfriend told me that as a kid, he always wanted to live in one of those houses that were totally decorated for trick-or-treating and handed out full-sized candy. Here's where I messed up. I took this as a comment and not a plan. When the end of September came, we went to the Halloween store and he was under the impression he had savings for this. I didn't know. And he was under the impression we had savings for this. I didn't know. We go over the monthly budget together and it was never listed. 
when he found out that there was no Halloween savings, we had an argument. Afterwards, I talked to my friends who all said he had talked about trick-or-treating extensively and how much it meant. I chalked this one up to a misunderstanding on my part, so I came up with $500 of my money and I went to him with an apology. Okay, are we serious right now? He decided to buy one big piece, an animatronic clown and some lights. It burned through the $500, plus he put a little on his own credit card. He wanted another big piece and was mad that I wouldn't put it on my credit card. I asked if he wanted to put up homemade decorations or spider webs, but he said that would look cheap. A few weeks later, we had a fight over the candy. He was still stuck on buying full-sized bars. We easily get over 250 trick-or-treaters, and I said we just don't have that much money. So we got the bulk bags of good small bars. I also had these little coloring books for the allergy and diabetes kids. Jump forward to Halloween. Early kids show up, and he's letting them grab handfuls. I remind him how we have a ton of trick-or-treaters coming and he got really annoyed. I had ordered a pizza for us, so I get it and go inside for about 10 minutes. By the time I came back out, the trick-or-treat bowls were empty. He had been dumping a third of a bowl in each kid's bag and had given out all the coloring books to whatever kids came along. He told me that I'd have to go run out and buy more candy on my credit card. I said I wasn't going to do that and it wasn't my fault he just handed out 20 pounds of candy. He started yelling right there in front of the kids and I told him to come inside. He responded that he wasn't stopping trick-or-treating even if there was no candy. I told him to have fun with the clown and went inside. He came in 15 minutes later, then he demanded that I leave for the night so that he could clear his head. He argued it was fair because I had already eaten and it was my fault that trick-or-treating was ruined because I'm cheap. I handed the rest of the pizza to him and I refused. He left and went to a friend's house and I guess they spent the rest of the night drinking, handing out trick-or-treat candy, and texting me how awful and cheap I am. Am I the jerk? You're only the jerk if you stay with this guy. He sounds like a bozo. A lot of the debt is understandable. He spent part of his childhood in foster care, and his parents kicked him out when he was 18 with nothing really. He went into debt early to pay for his basic needs, never really learned how to have financial literacy. Only when I pointed it out did he start to pay more than the minimum on his debts and start to work his way out of it. He had a really toxic childhood, and this is his first real stable situation. Apparently, trick-or-treating was the time he sort of got to see clean and stable homes, and he got more to eat out of that candy than he did at home. Having this big Halloween display, to him it was a sign that someone had made it. I really didn't understand how much it meant to him, but his friends are on me about it. Why are you with this guy? Does he pay anything resembling rent? Has he ever shown any signs of financial responsibility? OP, he makes me laugh. And yeah, after we sort of had a dragged out fight over finances early on, he has paid his half into the household fund every month, budget covering everything that is communal, mortgage, utilities, etc. I have my own money and he has his. We earn similar, but because he's working on debt, he ends up having less personal money than I do. After we had an argument the first month, I set up a monthly house budget that just covers communal things, and he has been contributing his half to it since. So, half the mortgage, utilities, etc. Because so much of his money is going to debt, I have more flexible personal budget, and I put money into savings. But yeah, financially, he pulls his weight, and he spent the summer being compulsive about having a perfect lawn, so it's not like he's useless around the house. Update. Three months ago, basically the whole internet told me to break up with my boyfriend. Two days ago, I finally ended it. Everyone, and I do mean everyone, online, basically said I was in the right and said some truly dire things about my relationship. I won't lie, there was so much anger towards him, I sort of shut down. When I started getting requests from actual news sources for more information, I just basically logged out and just decided to forget anything ever happened. We met the next day as he had spent a few nights at a friend's house. I said that for things to continue, we needed couples counseling and I expected him to set up the whole thing. He was surprisingly open to this and said he would work on it and that's where things started to unravel. Our mutual friends had been in his corner, complaining about me, but I found out the story that he had told them was way off from the truth. In his version, I prevented any money for Halloween and had gone cheap on trick-or-treat candy and was only handing it out to kids that I liked. Once they sort of heard my version, backed up with pics and receipts, support went to me. In fact, his friends have been giving him a lot of ribbing about how he acted, which my now ex hates. In the meantime, he's been working on getting us counseling, but found that getting therapy on his insurance meant months-long waiting list. 
So instead, he came up with this couples coach who was religious. I'm not religious and I wasn't thrilled by this, but I figured it was better than nothing. Our first meeting was only three days after I posted. One funny thing that came up was that my ex immediately handed over a printout of the household budget and the coach praised it. But the coach thought my ex was the one who wrote it and that I was failing to follow it. So what followed was this weird thing where my ex wanted all the praise, but also wanted the coach to badmouth the budget because my ex hates it. It took the better part of the first session to explain to him the actual situation and the coach was weird about the fact that it was me in the relationship dictating money, even though he liked the budget itself. This was a lot of issues later actually. The next day, one of our friends found the Reddit post and sent it to my ex. All heck broke loose with him saying that I had betrayed his trust. Our next couple's coaching session was all about that and honestly, I felt terrible for airing his dirty laundry. The coach and my ex both went off on me for the fact that I had publicly humiliated my ex. Obviously, I'm updating, so I don't care about embarrassing my ex anymore. He has this username and will probably read this. Whatever. One thing that was seemingly positive at first about the coaching was the coach pointed out that my ex had never had the ability to have holiday traditions because of his upbringing. I genuinely felt bad about this and rolling into Christmas made a huge attempt to incorporate him into my family's traditions and to ask him if there's anything he wanted to do. He responded by insulting my family's traditions and his only contribution was to suggest something really extravagant that would have cost a fortune. I swear he only did this just to badmouth me when I said no. This was all bookmarked by our twice a week visits to the couple's coach who I increasingly hated. He would go through super religious prayers and having issues with us living together before marriage. Neither my ex or I responded positively to this. But my ex would really get into it when the coach was talking about how he should be the head of the household. When I said I'd prefer moving to a regular therapist, my ex said I was undermining his work getting us help. There's a dozen little things that happened in there where I should have broken up with him, but last week was the real final straw. Ever since my ex found the post that I had made on Reddit, he's been obsessed with going through my phone. Because of my career, I wouldn't let him. I have a lot of emails and accesses on my phone to sensitive information in regards to work. I made a compromise that he could ask who I was texting, etc., and I'd show him at any point. This wasn't good enough. I don't know how he got into my phone, but he went through it fully and started raging out that I was keeping things from him, but none of it had any relation to him. Like I had a group chat where we were planning a wedding shower for a friend. He's only met this friend in passing. He knew I was helping to plan it, but was mad that I hadn't let him know every little detail. Specifically, we were surprising the bride by flying in her aunt who she rarely sees. I wasn't contributing to this financially, I just knew about it and somehow my not telling him that specific little thing was keeping secrets. We were still fighting over this when we went to a party with friends. Apparently, in digging through my old chats, he found where a friend of mine had talked to me in confidence of a tragedy she went through. Only her husband and sisters were really in the know. My ex was drunk and started talking about this loudly to her with her husband right there. Her husband told him to shut up, and my ex basically got all superior about knowing things and there not being secrets. It was very close to being a fight. I told him not to come back to my house after that and he seems really shocked we broke up. I'm still numb about all of this, but yeah, him never again. Update. The ex finally came by to pick up his stuff about a week ago. He's hemmed and hawed about this now since he left. Initially, he only took the bare essentials and his drug his feet. I think he thought that I'd take him back. Finally, he shows up with a friend to get his stuff. Every single thing he pulls out of the house, he's snidely telling me that I will miss having it. But before he moved in, I had a fully furnished house. His contributions were either things that only he used or stuff that I had duplicates of. Except for the clown. When that finally came up, he was angry. He said that he was now living out of his friend's bedroom and doesn't have room to either store it or to display it at Halloween. So he wanted me to pay him back for it. I pointed out that I had paid for it in the first place. He has this whole alternate scenario where I had given him the money to buy it as a gift. Therefore, it was his money and I had to repay him. An argument broke out. He stormed out with his stuff and left the clown. I sold it for $200 and I look forward to visiting it in a proper long-term Halloween setup. The boyfriend is the clown. People say Reddit promotes breaking up too fast and to that I say, see the post. Jerks don't become better as they age. You should invest in wine or kimchi instead. I used my meal plan to feed over 120 less fortunate people. This happened my freshman year of college about 20 years ago. 
My university had just invested in a big new dining hall, and to help pay for their investment, required all new students to buy a 150 meal plan both semesters. This was a big financial burden, being from a lower middle class family, but my parents pooled funds to help me out and make it happen. Shortly into my first semester, I found out from friends the meals you didn't use didn't roll over. Since I lived off campus, I knew I wouldn't be able to use them all. Heading into November, I realized I would end up with 60 to 75 meals left over, and I complained about this a lot to my family and friends because it seemed like such a waste. In comes the plan. My freshman year of college was also my cousin's senior year, and we hung out pretty often. He was the biggest trickster and prankster type you ever met. One night while we were drinking, he says, What if you brought a bunch of homeless people to use up your meals? How much would that upset those self-righteous jerks? We laughed all night, but the more I thought about the idea, the more I really started to like it. We talked all weekend about it, and we hatched up a plan. On Monday morning, we went down to the local Salvation Army around the corner. I've grown to really despise this organization, but in the early 2000s, in small town USA, it's what we had. We told the lady at the desk I would like to feed people in need with my meal plan. She was hesitant at first, but said that she was working with people that this would be a huge blessing to, especially during the holiday season. She helped me organize two days that following week, where around 30 people would meet me to eat at the dining hall. I would wear a certain hat so they could find me, and we would go eat. The day finally arrived, and all kinds of people were there. There were homeless people in tattered clothes. There were families with kids that seemed excited to go out to eat. There was even one family I will always remember that seemed embarrassed to take a handout, but I made an effort to talk to everybody and make them feel welcome. At noon, we headed into the dining hall. I walked up to the lady at the entrance and said, These people are with me. They're my friends. I would like to swipe them in. She looked confused, but reluctantly said okay. To say we got every reaction humanly possible would be an understatement. There were staff that were obviously annoyed with this influx of diners. There were students that were laughing. There were students that were giving me the silent clap. There were snobbish faculty members that seemed to be disgusted at the type of people coming into the dining hall. I didn't care at all. Eventually, a head staff member came up to me and said they knew what I was doing and they didn't like it. I said, these are my friends eating with me. I paid for these meals. Am I doing anything wrong? She was stumped. The next day, the same situation happened with the same reactions. It seemed that I had caused quite a stir on campus and it just so happened that the university president was eating there that day. She came up to me and said even though she would ask that I not tell my friends to do the same thing with their meals as the staff couldn't handle the influx of diners, she was proud that her students had the heart to do something for others like this. The following semester, I did the exact same thing. I even used my meals sparingly so I could bring more people. The one memory that will always stick out in my head is the family with the little kids so excited to go to the pizza bar and soft serve ice cream machine giggling the whole time. To this day, it's still one of the proudest moments of my life. Me and my friends and family still have a drink and chuckle over this story and the snooty angry reactions that I got. Idiot fiance breaks up with me, ruins his own life. I'm 27 female. Last week, my fiance, who's 29 male, we'll call him Mason, broke up with me because I told him that I didn't want to leave my job and move across the country so he could be a streamer. I make very good money here in Minneapolis. My family's here, and I love the scenery of the area, outside of the city, of course. My ex was basically a stay-at-home boyfriend. He only worked 20 hours a week as a barista at Starbucks that's literally a five-minute walk from our apartment. I worked as a NICU nurse, and I made good money, so I was never worried about our financials. What worried me was that Despite Mason having a biology degree, he was never able to get a full-time biology job. I think he was never even looking in the first place. I told Mason that I would be happy to help him pay for the master's and PhD program he was supposedly interested in doing, but he never put in the work to do any research into it or apply. Instead, he was obsessed with the idea of becoming a streamer and moving to LA. But Mason never had time to stream or work on building a social media presence. He has literally two followers on Twitch, and the last time he streamed was a year ago. I paid for everything, the apartment, our groceries, his medication, his pet fish, all of our dates that I always planned, but despite working crazy hours, I was always the one grocery shopping on my way home and cleaning the dishes and cooking and doing laundry. The only thing he would do consistently was clean his fish tank and turn on the Roomba. But sure, I'm the problem when I tell him to stop piling the trash up 12 inches over the edge of the bin and actually take it out, 
and I'm the problem when I told him that I was not going to leave my job and pay for us to move to LA and leave my entire family behind when he's literally done nothing to make his own aspirations come true. Dude sits at home for 50 hours a week eating Takis and playing video games that he isn't even streaming and expects me to cook dinner as soon as I get home from the hospital. So we had a fight and he broke up with me. Genius move. So I canceled the lease on my apartment and I'm staying with my sister while I go house hunting and deleting every trace of that idiot from my life. He's tried calling and texting me, but I'm done with his leeching. I just wish other people could see through his carefully crafted lies because I've lost two friends who are just eating up his sob story. Can't believe I'm such a mean girlfriend who won't be my man's mommy. Wow, you're such an amazing woman to have supported this man so much financially. You deserve someone way better. Maybe it's best you don't marry him. I mean, don't you want someone with more substance and contribution to the living situation? This whole thing sucks. I'm sorry you're going through this. OP. Oh, absolutely. But I didn't think it would always be like this. I was under the impression that he wanted to get his PhD in biology and work professionally in that field until recently. I thought he was genuinely struggling to get interviews and to get accepted into a program. I mean, if I was working super hard and trying to get into a PhD program, I would want my partner to be supportive of me. But in reality, he wasn't working towards that at all. He just decided he didn't want to and have to grow up, I guess. I'm just a bartender and you know everything? Okay, have a nice shower. This happened about 10 years ago now. I had been working in catering and hospitality, managing pubs, for about 10 years at that stage. The catering company I worked for had come up short-staffed for a small function slash festival that they were putting on. Probably max 200 people at a venue that they controlled. I was in a different division but was asked to help out on the bar and the bump in and out. Easy enough and the music was looking pretty good, so I agreed. It was in the middle of spring. The weather had not yet been really warm yet, so we were just expecting decent numbers but nothing special. Bringing in the bar was easy enough. The venue was massive and easily able to accommodate the truck, etc. Having a single mobile bar with just one tap instead of three was probably on the light side, but I figured the venue manager knew what he was doing. So I introduced myself to him and I got to work. I unloaded and brought all of the gear and beverages in and I made a couple of attempts to discuss how we had set up the service area. Each time I was shut down with progressively more aggressive language until he finally told me, I've run dozens of functions at this venue. I know how to set it up. We really only ask for a bartender. Okay, no problem, I thought. I didn't mention to him that it had been me who had picked up the truck from the warehouse, collected the bar and 10 kegs from our supplier, as well as the other beverage package and delivered it to him, or that I was the only one able to bump it all out at the end of the evening. So I just agreed with whatever he said and I set up what he wanted. So the weather ended up being a beautiful day, about 27 Celsius, 80 Fahrenheit, with a light breeze and the turnout was more like 400, much better than expected. Pretty quickly it turned out that we were struggling to keep up with bar service, so I suggested that rather than a traditional service, we should have one person on the till, one person constantly pouring beers, like never shutting off the tap, and one person filling other drinks, wine, soft drinks, etc. Again, I was snapped at by the now clearly stressed venue supervisor. You just keep serving and let me do the thinking. Okay, so now I've had enough. Customers were getting frustrated at the slow service and this peanut was too proud to accept advice from someone far more experienced. And then the keg blew. I was about to change it when the peanut stepped in and said that he would take care of it. I checked that he knew what he was doing and was assured he had done it a hundred times and to back off and leave him to it. So I did. I watched him not uncouple the gas line and go straight for the beer lock. Happily, he had his face right in front of the spot, so as soon as he cracked the lock, he copped a huge spray in the face of a nice warm beer foam. All through his hair and all over his glasses, wet all down the front of his shirt as well. It was glorious, and the first 30 people in line thought so as well because they had witnessed some of his antics. I didn't hear much out of him for the rest of the day. He asked me to change the kegs when needed and pretty much stayed away from the service area. We streamlined things as well, and although it didn't end up a success as far as customer satisfaction, it was not the disaster that was brewing. Wake me up with your alarm? Guess my day starts now too. I, 28 female, live with my boyfriend, 29 male, and one roommate who's 35 male, in a house that I own. They both work at the same company, so their workday starts at 6am. I work from home, so I sleep and get up pretty much whenever I want. 
It's worth noting that I'm a very light sleeper and my boyfriend is a fairly heavy sleeper that I usually have to wake up despite his alarm. My boyfriend's alarm goes off at 5.30. He usually gets dressed and heads to work by 5.40, which is fine. In those 10 minutes, I'll pack his lunch, make him coffee, and get him set up for the day. My roommate, however, has a very loud, blaring alarm that goes off every 5 minutes between 5 and 5.30 when he finally rolls out of bed and gets ready. Even on weekends, he'll sometimes let his alarm go off until 6 until it finally shuts off on its own. It's very annoying. I have no idea why he sets his alarm to be so loud that the whole house has to hear it, especially since he's also a light sleeper, supposedly, and has expressed before that me watching TV in my room at night keeps him up, even if I close the door. If the alarm was quieter, I wouldn't care, but at that point, he wakes up my dogs, and he's even woken my boyfriend's daughter, who's three, who stays with us on occasion. Needless to say, once that first alarm goes off at five, I'm awake, and so is everyone else. I don't know if you've ever dealt with a toddler being unwillingly woken up at 5 a.m., but it's not pretty, especially since she usually wakes up between 9.30 and 10. I've asked him a number of times if he could just turn down the alarm a little so he doesn't wake up the whole house. He refuses to do so. Cue petty revenge. My wake-up routine usually involves taking a shower, then doing the dishes and cleaning, caring for the dogs, etc. If we have the baby, I'll make breakfast and put on a show for her to watch while she wakes up. Two of my three dogs are fairly large, so they make noise when I let them out of their crates and feed them. So the past few days, I've been dragging myself out of bed at 5 and starting my routine, none of which I do quietly. I'm awake anyway, and it's my house, so I can do what I want. The toddler will usually fall asleep again on the couch, even if I turn on the TV, so I put a show on for her at a normal volume, at 5. My dogs are energetic, so I let them out of their crates to run around, at 5. Dishes? 5 a.m. TikToks in the living room, 5 again. Wake me up at 5, that's when my day will start. I haven't gotten much out of my roommate except for dirty looks and the occasional, why are you awake? To which I simply respond with, because you woke me up. He's not the sharpest tool in the shed, so he started to complain that I'm being petty for no reason. I again suggested for him to turn down the alarm or at least lessen the frequency, but he's refused to do so. Guess we'll all just keep waking up at 5. Except for my boyfriend, of course. He can sleep through virtually anything. Bless his heart. I should go wake him. Edit. A lot of people are asking the same stupid questions, and I'm tired of answering them. Yes, I pack my boyfriend's lunch in the morning. Yes, it's because I want to. No, nobody is in danger. Yes, I've tried talking to my roommate. No, I don't care what anyone thinks about our parenting and dog rearing. I just thought I'd share a silly little story about a small way I got back at my crappy roommate. This has gotten so out of control. I'm not going to answer any more comments. If you want more info, read what's already been written. To those of y'all who made me laugh and or gave me alternate suggestions on how to deal with them, thank you. I'll definitely keep some of this in mind as I move forward. Off topic perhaps, but why doesn't he do his own lunch, make his own coffee, and set himself up for the day? Do you have three toddlers living with you? OP. Why? Because I do it for him. He doesn't care either way but I enjoy doing it because I know he appreciates it. He tells me all the time, and also I love him. I'm okay with everything you did, except putting your dogs in crates. OP. Thankfully, I came here to talk about my petty revenge, not ask people what they thought about my parenting or dog rearing. You certainly did. I, on the other hand, came to the comment section solely to disapprove of the fact that you put your dogs in crates after reading your story. If I had a partner like that, I would let them sleep until noon until they figured out how to adult and take care of their kid. Video screen for a toddler first thing in the morning? You're kidding, right? There are so many red flags. Frankly, I would kick the bunch of them to the curb and not look back. You pack his lunch? OP. Why are so many people hung up on this? Yes, I pack his lunch. I want to. It's something I contribute to the relationship. He's not forcing me. What does this have to do with anything? Is your partner an adult or not? Why are you packing his lunch and getting him set up for the day like he's a baby boy going to school? Is he incapable of looking after himself? When I read crap like this, I cringe so hard. Does the school bus toot for him too? Does he need a little lunchbox? Edit. You also have a kid, so you're working full time and you have two kids to look after. Your man needs to pull his weight and stop treating you like his mom. Edit 2. So you both work, yet you do all the childcare? House cleaning and pet care? And your partner does what? 
treat you like a maid. OP, my goodness, have you people never heard of doing small things for your partner to make their life better? He's perfectly capable of doing this stuff himself and has done it himself for a long time. But I took over because it doesn't inconvenience me to do so. And yes, I love him and I enjoy doing these things for him. For goodness sake, not everyone gets bitter and resentful when they put effort into their partner's happiness. It's my choice and has nothing to do with the rest of my post. Also, I have no idea what you're talking about. I work from home and I'm only part-time and I wrote multiple times that we only have the baby on occasion, not 24-7. Find something else to be mad about. Goodness gracious. This is why I never talk about nice things I do for Reddit, boy. I don't want to deal with the wrath of the people on Reddit. But you don't do anything nice for me, Karen. Silence, you fool. Manager targeted me because of my family priorities. It cost her her job. I have worked at a certain home improvement store for close to a decade now, about eight years roughly. The first seven was in North Carolina before I moved up further north to be with my best friend and her husband, who I learned was pregnant with my first godchild. As such, I transferred up to a store in the area and put my nose to the grindstone. I worked garden before and did that for some months before I started to be moved from department to department as this store was low on staff. However, this was not full time. My old HR had dropped the ball and this store believed I wanted part time. Having already moved, I grabbed a part time overnight job at a gym to make ends meet and continued to work, all the while asking repeatedly for full time at the main job and never getting a definitive word back or change. Several months into this, my goddaughter was born. As I lived with my friends during this time and during the time of lockdown, I spent quite a lot of time helping to raise her and we became close. I would take time off that I was allotted to help look after her and there were no problems. Half a year into this change and I had made a good name for myself. I did not have a good deal of friends per se, but I was respected for my work ethic and willingness to help out anyone in any department that asked me. Enter a new assistant manager. The ASM was abrasive to staff and used to getting her way. The first I heard of her was when she outright fired a girl working the front desk because of a logo on her jacket. Myself and several other employees organized a walkout in protest of this and succeeded in getting the store manager to reverse the decision made by the ASM. This was not our first walkout, having done this in the past whenever another ASM, the current's predecessor, made mean comments about a cashier. Soon after this, I was given full time by the ops manager, working and receiving for a cantankerous supervisor. We often did not get along, especially as my godchild got older and I took on babysitting duties while her parents worked and slept. It was not something I minded as I adored the kid. I often talked about her with my coworkers and loved to show pictures and stories. However, this was not something shared by my higher ups. My supervisor was upset that I could not work overtime to help him as we were the only two in receiving for the store because of either my second job or babysitting. And soon after the second walkout, I was made aware of a rumor circulating around the store that the kid was in fact my own daughter that I had fathered outside of my friend's husband's knowledge. The source of the rumor was unknown, but my ASM had made disparaging remarks to me in the past about men taking care of kids, so I had my theories. My holiday plans, asked off in advance as soon as our electronic system allowed, were cancelled without explanation, both Thanksgiving and Christmas. I had never missed a major holiday since I moved north and I had asked the same days off the year prior and had gotten them off before the ASM arrived, strike one. And soon after this, my supervisor, whom I work closely with every day, had a positive test, forcing me, per company rules, to self-isolate until I could get a positive or negative test myself. During this week, as it took a full week to find a place with enough room to give tests, I was harassed repeatedly by text and phone call by both management and my supervisor to track down an at-home test and get back to work ASAP. All the while, I had to inform everyone I was in contact with, including my friends, family, and roommates, that I had been exposed, risking their own holiday trips and plans. Strike two. Thankfully, my test was negative. A week after this, the Northeast gets slammed by a snow and ice storm. I drive a four-wheeled vehicle and so made it in, but near the end of my shift, I was made aware that my friend's husband had been injured and stranded in a car accident on the ice and so left to get them home and their car to a service station. To add to it all, they have lost power in their home with an infant, leaving me the only person they could turn to with a vehicle and power. 
I will admit, I had a few sick hours left, but informed work that I would be out on a family emergency. For that week, I called out each day with ongoing family emergency, with snow and ice still coating the streets and power still down throughout our city. And every day, I was hounded by calls from management, demanding I return to work regardless. This would have not only risked my own safety, but would have stranded my family at my apartment with no way to get supplies or get home once the power returned. Strike three. I was done. Early in the morning that following Sunday, I walked into work and placed my resignation letter on HR's desk. That is important later. I had tendered it to be immediate, as I live in an at-will state. Was it petty? Yes, I will freely admit that. I had given eight years of my life to this company and asked for very little in return. As I was leaving, I crossed paths with my supervisor, who asked angrily if I was finally coming back to work. I informed him of my decision to leave, ignoring his provocations, and left to go home and sleep. Several hours later, I received the gift that would ignite my semi-accidental revenge. A single text from my ASM, We will see how long you can take care of your love child without us. Well, well. Seems I found my probable source. My friends had been made aware of this rumor from the start. I did not hide anything from them, and they did not want any kind of rumor, however unlikely, to reach them from anyone but me. They are my closest friends and compatriots, and have given me the greatest gift in the form of my godchild, whom they insist I call my niece, as I am family. Love child feels like an insult against her, and I am not cool with that, and neither are they. However, they inform me of the monumental mess-up my now former ASM had made. It was time for corporate HR to be made aware, and so I began to compile my evidence, the texts from my supervisor, the call records and messages left, and this holy grail of a text message. If I was going to leave, I was at the very least going to give some blowback on the team that had been so willing to target me. What happened after is secondhand from friends I had that still worked at the store, and so I cannot entirely verify all of it. But the ASM? played herself. The following day, a meeting of management and supervisors was convened, where the ASM made it known that I had been fired, not self-terminated, for job abandonment and immorality. And unless I am grossly misinformed about the nature of American retail work, immorality is not a fireable event. So to my supervisor's credit, he defended me to the ASM and was fired on the spot. The store's HR rep, having earlier gotten my printed termination letter on his desk, made it known that I had indeed not been fired but left on my own, and the ASM attempted to fire him as well in front of the staff, and from there it spiraled. According to my source, entire departments began to walk out or outright quit, having had their own problems with the ASM. Appliances? Quit to a man. Garden? Left with their manager to work at a competitor's as he had been working on this well before my saga began. Front desk? Walked out in protest, as it came out that the ASM had threatened and blackmailed several part-time workers to not wear their headscarves if they wanted ours. Lumber, receiving's main partner, quit. Pro Desk joined the front desk protest. Cashiers, both head cashiers quit and the other trained cashiers walked out with the desks. Ops manager, had informed the district manager and quit outright before he arrived, walking out with the HR rep and my old supervisor. My source's last report of the ASM was seeing her sprinting to her car after having heard that the district staff was inbound and the store manager was forced to shut the store down for the next two days. Last I've heard. I've been in contact with the other injured parties and we're compiling all the evidence we've collected as several of the families are hiring lawyers. I suspect the company will attempt to keep this quiet. I just never suspected that anything like this would happen. I have a full-time position at the gym upcoming and I've been enjoying the extra sleep and time I get to spend with my family. I'm never working 56 to 64 hour weeks ever again, and I will never darken the doorstep of that store again. I hope my ASM enjoyed the temporary rush of power. I suspect she won't get it ever again, at least not in manager positions. Karen mocks me at my party, so I pulled off her wig in front of everyone. I, 26 female, had a bachelorette party on Saturday. It was a homely affair, as I'm not the type to go out of town and get drunk. It was a dinner for people I know and their guests at the church recreation center which my parents spent a good deal of money on to make it seem nice. It was followed by gift opening. At this party, one of my friends brought Helen, someone that I'm not close to but she is in the friend group. 
About two years ago, I slowly started to distance myself from her as she has shown some jealous tendencies that she masks as others being jealous of her. She's two years older than me. I've never liked her, but you have to respect the plus one on your guest list, even if she wasn't on the RSVP list. Or at least that's what my mother told me. During the gift opening, she made some remarks about how so-and-so decided to wear the same shoes as her because she gets copied a lot for her fashion sense. Made a remark about cheap extensions another guest wore, insulted the dress my niece was wearing as well. I took Siobhan aside as it was her guest and I told her to keep her under control. She promised that she would. When we cleared the floor for dancing, instead of helping, she went around and pulled down my ratty decorations. I asked her politely to leave if this wasn't her scene. She turned around and accused me of taking her leftovers as she said that she had hooked up with Andrew. My fiancé's name is Michael. Andrew is his brother who's three years older than him. She patted my stomach and said, Yep, you are pregnant. Why else would you be getting married before me? She even made a comment about me waiting to the last year of secondary school to get taller than her, to steal away all the boys' attention to spite her. I'm 5'5 five five and she's 5 foot. I had a growth spurt and it's not something that I could control. She picked up my hairdo and said I even copied her hair color. It's my natural auburn that I've had my whole life. I grabbed her by the hair to pull her towards the door as she kept knocking my hand away when I tried to grab her by the arm. That's when the wig came off. She ran out on her own crying. Am I the jerk for how this went down? My mother thinks that I was not the best host and that my generation is too individualistic to be hosting with manners. Siobhan said that I should have just let her come out of the toilet instead of dealing with it myself as Helen has been feeling down lately. The guy she was with dumped her a few months ago after two years because he didn't want to get married, but Helen found out that he's getting married to the girlfriend he has been with for under two months. Of course, that made me the bad guy. Siobhan said that I was quite insensitive. You were insensitive? She has to be joking, right? Because how the heck is someone going to talk smack and trash at your bachelorette party about you, and when you snap, you're the bad guy? I would have started throwing hands and not just grab her by the hair. Having a hard time is not an excuse. I'm sick of hearing that when people like Helen use it. But it's not an excuse on what she did to you. It may be a factor, but it's not an excuse. She seems like the type, I'm having a bad day, so I'm going to make it everyone else's problem too. Also, get new friends. I'm talking about Siobhan. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. She needed to be brought down a few pegs. She's awful to people and deserved a bit of humiliation. She's been feeling down because no one wants anything to do with her. Don't feel bad. Even if you asked her to leave politely, I don't think she would have, just to be a jerk. You are awesome. Since when does Reddit applaud physical assault when someone says something you don't like? Well, let's be honest. It just depends on who's doing the assaulting. That's absolutely right. Gotta love Reddit. My 72-year-old mother-in-law threw away my things, so I kicked her out of my house. I, 36 female, live with my husband, 41 male. I have a decent relationship with my mother-in-law, compared to a lot of the horror stories I hear from friends. She's quite sweet and warm. She is, however, a little over-controlling. Overprotective. I'm not sure of the exact word, but she has very strong ideas about things and no sense of boundaries. For example, when she stays at our house, she takes over the kitchen completely and insists on cooking all of our meals. She cooks wonderfully, but she won't let me help her at all and puts everything away in the wrong places and then insists that her way is more logical. She only really comes over for holidays though, and I do like her a lot, so I don't mind putting up with these mild annoyances. I'm currently pregnant with our daughter, who will be born in a few months. This is a miracle. I really didn't think it would happen, especially so late, but we got lucky. When my mother-in-law heard, she was super excited and said she would come over to help us get ready for the baby. She offered to stay for the next six months or so to help out because my husband and I both work long hours and it will be hard to handle the baby on top of this. She's also pretty emotionally invested in this because she truly sees herself as part of our family. She arrived a few days ago and set herself up, then she started with the cleaning. I like collecting things from garage sales and such. Things like sculptures and books and baskets. Stuff a lot of people would consider utter junk. Our house is definitely overstuffed, but it's reasonably tidy and doesn't seem like a hoarder's house or anything. My mother-in-law, on the other hand, likes everything surgically clean. Yesterday, I came home from work to find the house like a war zone. She went through my cabinets and cleared out everything she considered junk, 
and had apparently made several trips to Goodwill before I got home. I was really angry and I asked her why she would even do this. She said that the house has to be tidy for the baby and that it would be dangerous for the baby to be in my cluttered house. Then she took the next huge bag of stuff and tried to walk out the door. I kind of lost it and I told her that she could get out right now. She was shocked that I was serious and she said she doesn't have anywhere to go and it's late. It was 9.30. I booked her a hotel room and I called a taxi. My husband came home an hour later and when I told him what had happened, he was furious with me. He says I disrespected his mom and was ungrateful for everything she's trying to do for us. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk, but you may want to consider why she did that. Your house may actually be cluttered with junk and she was helping. I of course don't have like photos of your house in its previous state, but what she did was a jerk move. Am I the jerk for getting mad at my roommate after she didn't feed the dogs? I, 18 female, have a roommate who's 26, also female. We rent a house together. I have two dogs. I got them when I moved in. They're about a year. They've been with both her and I since they were puppies. Despite this, I've never asked her to watch them, clean up after them, feed them, or do anything with them. They're my dogs. Recently, she told me that she wants to get more involved with them since she calls them her dogs, and she posts pictures about how much she loves her dogs and things like that. I thought it would be good for them to have another person they could trust, and it would be good for me because as a full-time student with a job, it's hard to take care of them all the time. The other day, I woke up at 6.30 to go to the gym. One of my classes was moved around, so I needed to go earlier. The dogs are usually fed at 7. I texted her and asked if she would feed them at 7. She said yes. I got home around 8 and they were barking and their bowls were empty. I went to her room to ask her if she fed them and she said she forgot. I didn't care too much. It was a mistake. I was just mildly annoyed. So I fed them and went about my day. A few days later, she asked to take them on their walk, which was great for me because that meant I could get some overtime. I agreed and showed her where everything was. But when I got home from work around midnight, the dogs were sitting by the door. They ran over to their leashes and harnesses. So I asked if she took them on a walk. She was sitting on the couch and she told me that she was going to, but it was too cold out for her, so she didn't. It was 15 Celsius, 60 Fahrenheit. So I took them out at midnight. If I didn't, they wouldn't have slept. Now this morning, I decided to give her one more chance because I had an early class. Usually on these days, I'll just feed them before I leave. But when I make their breakfast, I warm it up for them and I feel bad leaving it out to get cold. I knocked on her door at 6 a.m. before I left for the gym. She told me she would feed them at 7. I had to go right from the gym to school or else I'd be late. I told her that, saying I wouldn't be there if she forgot to feed them. She rolled her eyes and said, I'm an adult. I know how to feed dogs. I got home at 3.15 p.m. The dogs were laying by their bowls. So I went to her room. She's home all day, remote job. When I got there, I asked if she fed the dogs and she said, Oh, that's what I was forgetting. Can you do it since you're home now? I got mad at her and basically told her she was incompetent and that I hope she never gets a pet of her own because it wouldn't survive. Now her friends are texting me and telling me I was too harsh. Am I the jerk? Edit. I only felt comfortable taking overtime and shifting my class schedule around because my roommate said that she would help me. My dogs are very well taken care of with three homemade meals. They're on a raw diet but I gave my roommate detailed instructions. Two walks, an hour of playtime a day. I wouldn't have gotten dogs if I couldn't take care of them. This post is about my roommate repeatedly failing to do things she said she would do. As I mentioned, I do take care of my dogs on a very consistent schedule, which is why I was so upset that she didn't feed them when she said she would. There's only one day a week they're not fed at the same time, and it doesn't seem to bother them. It just makes me feel bad for their food getting a little cold while they're sleeping in but I do take them for walks before their breakfast and then again before bed. However, they have a doggy door, meaning the house has a backyard, so they're always free to run around. I give them three meals a day and then when I get home, we play fetch for an hour or two until they don't want to play anymore. While my schedule is full, I wouldn't have gotten animals if I couldn't take care of them. It wouldn't have been fair to them. Your issue is that your roommate is a liar. Get a new one. OP, the lease is up at the end of November. I've been talking to a few other friends and we're considering renting a house closer to our school and I actually trust them with the dogs, so I'll probably do that. Raw diet is bad for dogs. OP, I totally hear you on this and there are definitely some that are, 
but don't worry. All of their food I pre-check with their vet beforehand to make sure they'll be okay to eat. One of them has some tummy issues and kibble is too harsh for her, and the other gets jealous if they have different meals. Update. First, to all the people concerned with my dog's diet, thank you. I also got nervous when I got a few PMs about how vets are basically BSing when they talk about it. I called my vet to ask what the deal was and if their food really is safe, and they sent me their credentials for canine nutrition. So worry no more, they're in good hands. Second, there seemed to be some confusion, which honestly is a little funny. I'm the 18 year old and my roommate is 26. Third, my dogs are microchipped and have been for a few months since they were old enough to get them. And they're registered to me, so don't worry about that. But again, thank you so much for your concern, it means a lot to me. And please stop saying I don't have the ability to take care of my pets. I do. I schedule things around them. Like I said in the edit, I only felt comfortable moving things around after she offered to help me. And lastly, I spoke to her friends. I took a few of them out to lunch today, and they told me she had said that I yelled at her after she gave them the wrong food. They believed it because admittedly, I am very particular about what they eat. But that's mostly because, as I said to someone in the replies, one of them has stomach issues. I cleared it up and they apologized. All but one of them, which honestly I don't care too much. I'll be moving out and won't ever talk to them again most likely anyways. Have you noticed how the commenters on Reddit always try to tell people what they're doing wrong with their pets? Sometimes I think they're just looking for an outlet to complain. Am I the jerk for showing up at my girlfriend's unannounced? I, 25 male, showed up to my girlfriend's, 30 female, unannounced after she said she didn't feel good. It's not far from me, so I made the decision to stop and check in on her just to see if she needed anything. It's her mother's house. It was 8.41 p.m. when I got there and I left by 8.43 for time reference. We've been together for a little over a month and I've been over there later at night dropping things off or working on something. I tapped on the door three to four times and a very slight knock using just one of my knuckles and I set a gift I had gotten her on the front chair, a Halloween wreath for her Jeep. Nobody answered the door, so I just shrugged and left, thinking nothing of it. I came to find out that she's upset with me, and her mother said I banged on the door, and I was there at 10 p.m., and now her mother feels unsafe in her house. I'm very confused, because I've never had someone get upset with me for that, especially after I've been there before, met them, and been on vacation with her daughter a couple of times already. My girlfriend was also inside, but didn't even hear my knocks, and was asleep, so she didn't even know I was there. Any advice would be greatly appreciated, because I don't think I did anything wrong. Not the jerk. Her mom is for lying. That aside, you said she let you know she wasn't feeling well and didn't want to make plans that day. And in another comment, you said she has a habit of letting her phone die. I'd be really creeped out if a boyfriend of a month stopped by my house unannounced, especially because it seems like she wasn't answering your texts. It's not cool to go over to someone's house when they're not answering your texts. Unless you're in an established, longer relationship, someone not answering you or answering you by saying they don't feel well means don't come over, I don't want company. Not come over and bother me at 9 p.m. OP. I can understand that. I didn't have any intention of anything longer than, hey, how are you feeling? And leaving. But I get what you mean. It doesn't matter what your intentions are. I would call her behavior establishing a boundary that she didn't want to chill that night. You convinced yourself you had a good reason to ignore her boundary. No, it doesn't matter your intention. If someone establishes a boundary, respect it. With that being said, you sound like a good dude. I would chalk this up to a life lesson. Ask your girlfriend if you could get her and her mom apology flowers or take them out or something. And next time she doesn't want to hang out, don't show up. OP, I wasn't trying to hang out there. I was only stopping, like I said, for a hey on the porch. Then I was gone. This is the first time this has come up and it wasn't an established boundary. I know that now it's a big problem. Thank you though. I know a lot of people say thank you condescendingly, but seriously, I appreciate everyone's comments, even the less than friendly ones. You're the jerk. Going to someone's house unannounced when you've only been seeing them for a month is not okay. I would have been upset too. You're the jerk. Major stalker vibes from you. Let me guess, you're just a nice guy, right? And guys like you wonder why we choose the bad boys. Gee, maybe because they don't show up at our house in the middle of the night like some psycho scaring the crap out of our moms. Hope you learn to stop being such a creep and thinking life is some stupid romantic comedy where us women will love you for being a weirdo. Dude, 
No woman wants you knocking on their door at that time, especially unannounced. Do you even know the world we live in? OP. Where I live, as I've written before, people leave doors unlocked and garages open. Also where I live, 8.40pm is not late. I work until 8pm a lot of days. I live in that kind of place too. You still don't drop in unannounced when you don't know someone well. It's called manners, especially when they turned you down in the first place, especially at night. You keep making excuses rather than listening to women tell you that this is the kind of thing that can be genuinely terrifying. And even here in a safe neighborhood, I've still been harassed. Second, oh, but I think it's fine, so I don't care about seeing it from their point of view. You might not think 9 p.m. is late, but I also worked until 8 p.m. a while ago, and I knew that everyone else was on a different schedule, so my normal was there late. Of course it was. The road to heck is paved with good intentions, and a proper apology means understanding why you upset them and acknowledging that. Since you're still saying all of these, oh, buts, I'm betting that apology wasn't a good one. You're the jerk. Not the jerk. I think this sounds very sweet of you. If I was dating a man and he showed up to check on me after I said I wasn't feeling well, I would know he's a keeper. Then again, I don't live in America, so perhaps it's a cultural thing. In my country, this act would be seen as caring and protective. These are values that we appreciate in men, and it makes them highly desirable to us. Actually, I have seen many posts where the men are called creepy, but in my country, these acts would not be called creepy at all. My sister and I joke that the reason birth rates are dropping in the US is because men are afraid to approach women now for fear of being called creepy. Am I the jerk for causing everyone to stop helping my sister-in-law? My husband has a sister who he'll call M. M and her husband have four kids. Both M and her husband are very loud and always angry and fighting over something, so we don't talk to them much. Recently, the kids were removed from their care and placed in the care of my mother-in-law. M has asked everyone in the family to help them. They need their home cleaned and several other things, so I went to their home to help. I had no idea how bad their home was. I haven't been there in years. They have a serious roach infestation. Not the big wood roaches that come in sometimes, I'm talking about the little disgusting ones that get into everything and you can't get rid of and they'll take your home with you by accident. They also had wall to wall stacks of trash and just about everything imaginable on the floors and counters. I couldn't even see the floor in most places. So we cleaned and cleaned and my husband and father-in-law paid for a dumpster to be brought. It took us several days of cleaning to even see the floors and we still have tons more to do. I'm terrified of roaches, so I wear gloves and coveralls and I'm trying to do my best to not panic. However, I've been ridiculously paranoid since starting this. I can feel them crawling on me even when I know I'm clean fresh out of the shower. I refuse to bring any of these roaches with me home. I change into fresh clothes before getting in the car to leave and I shove everything I wore into a garbage bag to wash immediately when I get home. Apparently, M saw me doing this. She got angry and asked if I thought I was better than her and made it a huge issue. Honestly, I just don't want roaches in my house at all. They're gross and terrifying and near impossible to get rid of. I tried to explain, but she just got angrier, so I just told her if this was her way of thanking me for my help, I can leave and she can do it herself. Several other people saw this and now no one is helping her anymore. I feel awful about it. I know she definitely needs help and didn't mean for any of this. I feel like a jerk. Edit. I didn't even think about bed bugs and other things. I was just freaking out over the roaches. Now I'm more paranoid and my husband and I are searching the house to make sure nothing came home with us. Though the washer is in a room of its own connected to the carport and I wash everything as soon as I get home and then I shower. I did braid my hair and had it up so nothing could really get into it. Hopefully I didn't bring anything home. Not the jerk. OP, you've done nothing wrong at all. I would be doing exactly the same. There's roaches, but there could be fleas or bed bugs and all sorts of things in that house. Your sister-in-law is clearly projecting on you because she must be embarrassed at how bad things have become, but that's no excuse to attack you when you were being helpful and also extremely sensible in what you're doing with your clothes, etc. Don't worry about feeling like a jerk. Your sister-in-law needs to stop being so dirty and start cleaning. My boyfriend says he will break up with me if we don't have a baby. I, 32 female, have been together with my boyfriend, 32 male, for four years. Since we started dating, we talked about and made sure we were on the same page about not wanting to have kids. We've been happily dating since then, and I have truly felt like I found my soulmate. We haven't talked about having kids again, and so I assume nothing had changed. 
until yesterday. We were on a crowded bus in the middle of the city center on our way to meet his mom and sister when he says that we have to get off and that he has something to tell me. So we get off and he starts crying, saying that he has realized that he wants to have kids and can't imagine a future without having at least one and that it has become more important to him than being with me and that we have to break up if I don't change my mind. I was really shocked. I had no idea he had been having these thoughts, but apparently he's been thinking about this for several months. I feel so betrayed that he didn't include me earlier on his thoughts and that it's gone so far that he wants to break up basically right away if I don't say yes. We don't even live together yet. The last year we have spent hunting for apartments and we are not financially stable enough yet either to even consider having a baby, which he now says he needs within a year. I told him that I don't want a baby right now and that giving me this weird ultimatum from out of nowhere is really unfair because he has had a lot of time to think about this, but I haven't. And I don't feel good about making the decision to have one under these circumstances either because to some extent it would be out of fear of losing him. I'm so mad at him because if he had clued me in on this earlier, we could have had a conversation about it and I could have considered having a baby with him. We talked all night and he has agreed to give me some time to think about if I want to have a baby with him and I honestly do not know what to do. If I say no, I lose the love of my life and if I say yes, I don't know if it would be a decision I make out of fear. What should I do? If you don't want kids, then let him break up with you. You're no longer compatible. If you're unsure, then give it some thought. But don't let fear of losing him put you in a position of having kids you don't want just to keep him because that's a good way to create a life that you hate. OP. I know what you're saying. It makes sense. But it hurts me so much to think about that right now. I know I need to just take some time to pass and think about it when I'm hopefully not as emotional. It's just so crazy that less than 24 hours ago, I thought everything was great and that we would spend the rest of our lives together. And now it's like this. It's hard to be rational about it. So you break up. Don't have a baby with him to keep him. That's the stupidest thing you can do. You'll be miserable. Any willing thoughts of having one right now are nothing but panic bonding. Happened to me when my ex dumped me because she wants kids. I came to my senses pretty quickly and still don't want a kid. Breaking up will suck, but you'll get over it. Should I, 34 female, break up with my boyfriend, 58 male, of 10 years, because he's broke? I know, I know, another age gap relationship. So just to preface, I'll say that there is nothing inherently wrong with our relationship. There's no financial, emotional, or any type of mistreatment. We've only fought a few times, and generally are two very well-keeled and stable people. I would say my biggest sorrow is not being of a closer age to him. I love this man. He's incredibly funny and makes me laugh every day. He's an amazing cook. He's a gentleman. There's a lot of great things to say about him and very little bad. However, I'm not sure if this is the correct path to go for myself. For context, we both make six figures and I'm moderately successful in my career and I make 60,000 more than him with upwards trajectory. If he wishes to, he can earn as much as myself easily. But at his age, he doesn't have any ambition anymore, which is understandable. It's a long story. But he spends most, and I mean taking our personal loans and borrowing from me, he still owes me in fact, of his money on his unemployed brother. He also has a nephew in high school, and I'm very sure he will spend money on him too as the nephew enters college. I don't see this stopping anytime soon. He shuts me down every time I talk to him about this, so I don't. I'm just afraid of what's going to happen if I stay with him. He doesn't have any retirement funds nor savings. He doesn't have property in his name. Technically, he has nothing in his name besides his stable job. I love him, but I'm frustrated and afraid. What happens in seven years when he retires? I'm unwilling to subsidize our current lifestyle with my wages alone. There's no chance of us ever building anything together, such as owning a property together, just because he's bleeding money not on us. All I want is to own my own home, but I'm working towards that goal alone, and it's lonely. I feel like I should leave while I'm still relatively young and free myself in being able to find a true life partner. But how do you do that after 10 years together? And is leaving someone shallow just because I want a financially equal partner that I can build a life with? I'm lost. I welcome any advice. So he makes six figures but borrows endless money and has never saved anything? He's not broke because he has a high paying job, but he's 58 with absolutely zero personal finance skill whatsoever. That's a problem. He refuses to talk about this with you. That's a problem. Plenty of people support family and also look after themselves and their partner. You're not a priority. That's the problem. 
It's not shallow to want a partner who will communicate properly with you and who wants to work together to share financial goals. That's like two of the most important, boring parts of a healthy relationship. What would he do if he wasn't dating you? Would he be going into appalling levels of debt and bankrupt himself for the sake of his extended family? If nothing else, stop lending him money and let him do that. Tell him flat out that his financial attitude means that there's very little future for you both and you're not going to subsidize his bad decisions at great personal cost to yourself. If he chooses to drown himself in debt, at least he won't take you down with him. If you don't want to support this man in his retirement, and likely his brother as well to some degree, then this relationship has an expiration date. You're not dumping him because he's broke. You're dumping him because he never valued planning or security in his future. You're dumping someone who nearly hit 60 without any real plan and has consistently lived beyond his already pretty solid means. You're dumping him because he's an adult who refuses to discuss these serious issues with his partner of 10 years, which means he's not really your partner. And you know he has accepted already, on some level, that his care will be your job. His actions say he thinks that's okay. He either expects that of you, or he's dumping it on you without even thinking about you. My daughter is demanding to go vegan. My wife and I have eight kids between us. I know it's a lot, no need to comment on it. This post is mostly about our 13-year-old, Gina. Gina came to me recently and said that she wants to be vegan. I told her I'll pay for groceries, but she'll have to plan and cook her meals. She can't live off frozen food or takeout, and her mom and I will be making sure that her meals are healthy before taking her grocery shopping. She was not thrilled. She asked if we could make a small change to our diet to accommodate her, like switching to vegan pasta and cooking the meatballs separately. But we said no, because we aren't going to change our food and eating habits because she wants to be vegan. She said okay and went to her room. Then she started sending me and my wife links to expensive pots and pan sets. One set was $800, plates, cups, and bowls for $200, and her own utensils. I asked her why she was sending this to me, and she said that she needs new pots and pans and plates, etc., because ours are contaminated. I told her ours are perfectly fine, and if she wants her own, she can buy them with her allowance and start babysitting. Later that day, I got a call from one of my sons saying that Gina was telling him and my other kids that they have to get all of their snacks out of the fridge in the game room. The game room has a kitchenette because she needs it for her vegan food. When I called and asked what she was doing, she said her vegan food can't be in the same fridge as our food and it's not fair to make her go all the way to the garage when she's hungry, so she thought taking over the game room kitchenette would be a good compromise. I told Gina I'm done with all the vegan BS and that she can't be vegan while living in my house. She threw a temper tantrum because she thinks I'm being cruel and she's barely spoken to me since then. So I wanted to know if I was the jerk. Not the jerk, but this issue is a lot more complicated. It's not about being a vegan. I have a 13 year old daughter. At this age, kids feel like they have zero control over their lives. They're desperately trying to find a way they can assert control. Let's also call a spade a spade. 13 year old girls are emotional roller coasters. May I suggest you and your wife have a heart to heart with her? Understand why this is important to her. Don't dismiss her feelings. After you've let her explain her position, calmly reiterate your family's limits and abilities to accommodate her food choices. This situation needs to be handled with communication. Nothing good ever comes from dismissing a teenager. Yeah, I wonder how much of Gina's demands are in part because she's lost in the shuffle of her new large family. And if OP's family is like many other big families I've met, there's probably a fair amount of domestic and childcare duties that are dumped onto her. I know that he doesn't want us to comment on it, but eight kids is a lot. Kids can feel lost in the shuffle with half that number, so I can only imagine eight. OP also mentions in another comment that they have one kid with a shellfish allergy, so there's no shellfish in the house at all, and another kid with severe medical issues whose diet is monitored and the family eats food that is okay for the kid. I wonder if this whole vegan thing is an attempt to get attention and consideration that she feels like she's not getting. I grew up with three siblings, one with a medical issue, and even though my parents were very attentive and present, sometimes I felt lost in the shuffle. I can't imagine what the girl must be going through. Being 13 is hard enough, but not feeling important in your own family must really suck. Telling her to make her own food makes perfect sense, but the family can still help accommodate her by making simple adjustments, like cooking the meatballs separately. Maybe they can compromise by starting with a vegetarian diet instead. That would probably be an easier transition for everyone, and then she can move to veganism as she gets older. You're the jerk for so many reasons. 1. 
Having 10 kids? I'm personally child-free, and I don't think anyone should be having kids with the current issues our world is facing. The fact that you have 10 shows how extremely selfish you are. 2. Your daughter wants to become vegan to make a positive change in the world, something you and your wife have no consideration of whatsoever. And instead of supporting her, you just inflict your outdated way of living onto her. I hope she goes no contact with you and finds friends who will support her in her journey to heal Mother Earth. And I hope you and your wife stop bringing kids into the world that you clearly aren't fit to raise. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or their daughter? Please let us know. I can't help but wonder if Reddit might not be the best place to seek parenting advice. Am I the jerk for not allowing my daughter to contact her biological parents? I, 40 female, and my husband, 42, have a daughter who's 9. She was adopted when she was born by myself and my husband, and she knows that she's adopted. Her biological mom was a very sweet 17-year-old who wanted to give her the best life she could. I don't know if her father ever even knew she was born. Recently, she had a school project where she was supposed to write about where she comes from. She's determined to find her biological mother and father to find out. I offered for her to write about our family instead. My husband and I don't want her reaching out to them. We told her this and she's upset, saying that we don't understand and she'll always wonder about them. She said we're being selfish and keeping her from finding out who she is. We obviously just want what's best for her. Am I the jerk? Commonly asked questions. The adoption was closed per my husband and I's request. The birth mother did give us her contact information in case our daughter ever wanted to find her. She does have a letter from her birth mother explaining why she was adopted and that it wasn't because she didn't love her. Update. I took some people's advice and called the phone number I have. To my surprise, she returned my voicemail. So I did get her age wrong. She was 18 when we adopted our daughter and is now 28, not married and no additional kids. She did confirm the biological father does not know my daughter was born. I let her know why I was calling, but I truly did not want them to have communication. I explained my reasoning and that we're her parents and are only doing what we think is best. She let me know that when my daughter and I are ready, she'll be there to answer any questions. I should also add her biological mother did offer to do an interview by sending a video answering my daughter's questions or an email. Please, please, please reconsider this. Do some research. My little sister was adopted at birth in a similar situation, and I'm a foster and adoptive parent now. And I promise, if you don't let her meet her birth family when she's younger, she will create her own narrative about them. They won't be real. They will be saviors or demons, and that will follow her into adulthood. Several questions about who she is, where her freckles came from, why she's allergic to cats. If she meets them now, much like a beloved but weird aunt, or a step-cousin who lives in the basement, or a best friend you adore but still see as human, she can accept them as real people, like all of us, with great attributes and maybe serious flaws. Even if she struggles, you have years left to process and be there for her and help her through it. That is not necessarily the case if your lack of support makes her take this journey as an adult or otherwise without you. Please evaluate whether saying no is really born out of your fears and anxiety. <coughs> and kindly, maybe a self-centered choice. You may worry that her birth mother is younger, prettier, funnier, that they will instantly connect, that you will be replaced. But you have to know that the bond you've grown over these past nine years is not replaceable, right? She will still love you. You are still mom and dad, and if she finds someone else to love and be loved by in this world, that's what we all want for our kids. Life is better the more people that love you. Please also look into some adoption communities. Adoption kids are so much more at risk of serious mental health issues, and a lot of that is these unanswered questions, this burden of never knowing their original families. Read The Primal Wound. Read studies on adoptee well-being. You would absolutely be putting her emotional and psychological health at risk by refusing her these connections. And if you do refuse, what's the upside for you here? She does it in secret online through Facebook research and forums and forms a relationship without you even knowing? I mean, she can just do a DNA test as a teenager and she'll probably get some hits and you'll never know. Maybe she even waits till 18, but now she knows your insecurity and finding her biological family isn't something she shares with you, either for your sake or hers. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk for not wanting their daughter to meet her biological mom or not? Please let us know. My wife keeps throwing away perfectly good leftovers and I'm sick of it. I, 33 male, started a fight with my wife who's 30 over her habit of wasting food. We come from very different backgrounds when it comes to food. Her family had the financial means to go out to eat frequently, 
often cooking large meals that could feed an army. In their household, the rule was that whoever got to the leftovers first could have them. On the other hand, my family was more frugal, only dining out on special occasions and cooking just enough for one or two meals. Takeout was never shared, and if we had leftovers, they were distributed equally. The disparity in our upbringings has caused significant disagreements in our marriage. My wife is the primary cook, and she tends to order takeout frequently because we both have demanding jobs. Throughout our 10-year relationship, she has learned to cook smaller portions to prevent food from spoiling. She doesn't really enjoy eating leftovers, as the smell of cold food often makes her feel sick. As a result, she tries to meal prep or cook just enough for two meals at most, knowing that wasting food bothers me. Whenever we have leftovers, I always inform her when her portion is still in the fridge. Usually she tells me to just help myself if I want more. She has previously mentioned that if she genuinely plans to eat it later, she would write her name on the container or tell me not to eat it. However, to the best of my recollection, she has never done that. I always tell her that the leftovers are hers so she can have them and we go back and forth like this for several rounds. The other night we had leftover Chinese takeout, her portion as I had finished mine. When she asked me what I wanted her to cook for dinner, I reminded her about her leftovers. She casually replied, oh yeah, hand it here. Surprisingly, she emptied the entire container into the trash without even looking at it. In shock, I asked her, what are you doing? She then explained that she had devised a new system. If she tells me three times that I can eat her leftovers because she doesn't intend to have them, she will discard them before they spoil. According to her, this was the fourth time I had reminded her about the leftovers, which triggered the disposal. I fell silent, trying to process the fact that she made this decision without discussing it with me. Eventually, I told her that she could have informed me that she was going to throw them away and I would have eaten them. She firmly believes that the statute of limitations had expired since she had already told me three times that I could have them and she believed that she had the right to do as she pleased with them. If I had known she was going to throw them away instead of eating them herself, I would have eaten them as I genuinely didn't mind her having them. I just feel like she hasn't truly listened to or disregarded my feelings and upbringing regarding food. Since then, I've told her to do as she pleases and we haven't really talked since. So, am I the jerk? You're the jerk. Your wife has made her position on leftovers very clear and you don't seem to be able to adapt to that. Let me recap. First, she basically gave you a free pass to eat her leftovers whenever you want because she by default doesn't want them. You weren't comfortable with that setup, though it doesn't sound like there was ever a situation where you ate her leftovers and she got mad about it. So you keep reminding her about the leftovers that she has basically said she doesn't want. She got sick of this and threw out the food. I understand that that's wasteful and upsetting to you, but you were driving her crazy and she snapped. She's also now given you clear expectations for the new system so that you both don't have to keep getting upset over this all the time. Also, just to cement you being the jerk, you say, if I had known she had tossed them instead of eating them, I truly would have eaten them myself. You're the jerk. You need to seek therapy. I also grew up in a really poverty-struck family. We were homeless multiple times on state assistance, went to food banks, you name it, we did it. I also cannot stand leftovers because of this. Unless I purposely buy something I know I'm going to eat as leftovers or that I'm meal prepping, I cannot do it. I'm steady, but I'm not well off, so I'm super careful, but admit I do toss more food than I care to admit. The reason I vote this way is because if you remind her three times and she tells you each time to eat it and you then continue to just remind her, it feels more like you're shaming her and instead of eating them first, second, or third time she told you to, then yeah, I don't blame her for tossing it. She's also your wife, not your kid. She doesn't need your permission to do anything. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. Today I learned that some people don't eat leftovers. I'm just not sure what this world's coming to anymore. First world problems, Karen. First world problems. I keep meeting my birth mom, but she doesn't know it's me. She had me when she was 14, and I, 24, a male, was given up for adoption. My parents told me about her growing up. I still have the letter she wrote me, and then she asked if they could give it to me. It's crazy reading it sometimes and knowing it was a literal kid who wrote it, saying she's sorry that she couldn't be my mommy, but she hopes I'm okay. She was open to having contact, but we moved from my dad's job when I was 11 and then it seemed impossible to find her. But luckily, I did. She's working at this small restaurant and I keep going, but she doesn't know it's me. We talk sometimes and she seems like a nice lady. Sometimes when she says something like, do you want a refill, honey? Or uses another term like that, I want to tell her. I don't know why it makes me nervous. 
We talk sometimes and she seems really genuine. If it's not super busy, she's more open to talking about random stuff. I literally drive two hours to come eat at this place just to see her and it's like she knows me already because I'm there once or two times a week for the past three months so she always says hi with a big smile. But man, if she only knew. Update. Well, I did it. I told her. And yeah, it was pretty heavy. My heart was even beating fast. I kept trying to think how to tell her. Many of the commenters on my last post here mentioned writing her a letter just how she wrote a letter for me. Originally, that was the plan, but for me, it felt like I needed to say it. Oh, really quick, I want to say thanks to everyone for your love and support, mostly to all the birth parents out there who shared their stories with me. That's what really helped me push to have the courage to confront her. It meant so much, so thanks. Everything happened the day before yesterday, by the way. I did wait for her to be done with her shift, and that was when they were closing the restaurant already and waiting in the parking lot. We said hi when she saw me first, but then I told her there was something serious that she needed to know. First, I told her sorry for keeping it from her this long. She didn't react until I actually pulled out her letter, and she started bawling from here, like screaming and crying at the same time, and I didn't even have to finish the whole I'm your son speech. She just saw it and knew. It was crazy. Next thing I know, she's hugging me instantly, but then she pulled back and asked if it's okay to hug me. Of course it is, and we're just there hugging each other and crying in the parking lot. It hit her hard though. Her legs gave out for a second, so I had to actually hold her up while she's still hugging me for a minute. What really got me was her saying to look at how big I got. Also hearing her cry made me cry too. She went back to open the restaurant up. She wouldn't take no for an answer. We had coffee, ate a slice of their pie, and talked. So much stuff that we talked about. She told me the second time I came to the restaurant, she got a feeling but for her it was hard to believe it was me, so that feeling she had was pushed way down. Because she told me for years after I was adopted, she saw kids that would be my age and used to think they were me. Then she would be crying in public. It really messed with her mind a lot and made her depressed, so she didn't want to do the same when she saw me, getting her hopes up like that. She says I look so much like my biological dad when he was younger though. We talked about him too. They stayed in contact with each other in case I ever reached out to one of them, so it would be easier to contact the other. I didn't have hope about finding my biological dad since he was never mentioned, so I'm glad they both planned for the future scenario. She told me about how they wanted to keep me, especially my biological dad. He didn't want me to be adopted, but he knew they had to because they were just kids. It took him a long time to get over it is what she told me. That's why he didn't leave anything, because he didn't want to believe he might not see me again. We talked for hours until almost 2 in the morning. They closed at 11. She just wanted to know everything about me, but her main thing was, am I happy? Were my parents good to me? Did I have a happy childhood? And I did. I told her thank you for helping to give me this life. We both cried again. She cried the most. Everything was emotional for her. Sometimes she would look really happy, but then get sad again. After my 18th birthday, she was hoping I would find her. That's why she stayed in the same city. But since I didn't, she always thought maybe I resented her, wasn't told that I had been adopted, or maybe had decided it was better not to have her around. It made me feel bad for not telling her sooner. She told me it's not my fault and I did right going at my own pace. Honestly, she's so sweet. The way she kept looking at me with the biggest smile, it made me emotional sometimes. Makes you think, how can someone who's been a total stranger your whole life look at you with so much love? It's wild. We learned so much about each other. She asked me if we could have dinner soon to keep talking. And if at some point in the future, if I'm interested to come over to her house so I can meet her husband. That all sounded really great. We exchanged numbers. After I left, she sent me a text telling me thank you for giving her this gift that she didn't even know if it would ever come. My girlfriend came over and she hugged me while I cried. I wasn't sad by the way. These were happy tears. Everything went better than I expected. There was still emotionally heavy stuff, but I'm still glad that we get to open up to each other. Update. Lots of you asked to let you know how it goes meeting my biological dad, and to say it was emotional is an understatement. I've been feeling so many things since this all happened. We met up a few days ago. Was originally supposed to be almost two weeks ago, but things kept coming up. Work, then I got sick for days, but we made it happen. To be honest, this was more nervous for me because I didn't know anything about him. With my biological mom, it was different because I watched her from far and got to know her a little before it came out. I asked my biological mom if she could be there too, just because she knows him better, so it was the two of us waiting for him at this park. He was already crying before we even got to him. This guy is strong too, so he pulled me in for the biggest bear hug and crying. 
He told me he wants me to know that they loved me so much and he loves me. I lost count how many times he'd come back in for one more hug. This definitely got to him and he kept saying, thank you God, a few times. Looking at my face, the feelings, man, the feelings. We had so many of them. Hearing him tell me how much they love me, even back then. It meant so much for me to hear that and not gonna lie, that had me holding him tight too. I'm sure everyone at the park thought it was weird seeing three people crying together. My biological dad said he cried so many times just driving over here, he didn't think he had any more tears until he saw us. When we were all sitting down, it hit me that my biological mom was not lying when she said we look alike. Obviously he's older, but still, wow, the similarities. He brought gifts too, which was a surprise. It was really nice. He told me I don't have to keep them if I don't want it, but he felt weird not coming with anything and he's wanted to give this to me for a long time. One was a teddy bear holding a picture frame of him at the hospital holding me. He was 15 years old. It's still crazy to realize that. And then the other thing was a journal. The journal was stuff he said he started writing to me years after I was adopted. He was in therapy and that that helped him to cope, thinking he would give them to me one day. His way of still feeling connected to me. I haven't read anything yet, but some of the pages were his thoughts and like if he's talking to me. How he felt when they found out she was pregnant, then the adoption, everything going on in his mind when he first got to hold me as a baby. I didn't even know he was at the hospital too. It was not what I was expecting. It really got me. I read some more of what he wrote last night that really got me crying. I'm sad to think how much this affected them emotionally for years. Also, I think it's pretty sweet he wanted to write this for me. We talked about his own life, which was pretty hard, his struggles with home life, and the feelings he had about giving me up. Then he wanted to know everything about me, basically with the same questions my biological mom had. I made sure they knew they made the right decision because my life was pretty great. He looked like he wanted to cry when he knew that because that's all they had hoped for and it was something he always wondered about for years. My biological mom left a bit after we were more comfortable so we could talk more in private and so it didn't feel too awkward between us. From there, he told me stories about how he met my biological mom. Sometimes he'd point out stuff he had noticed about me that reminds him of her or that we have similar likes. Example, I love eating mangoes. I can eat them all day and that's what I bought when we bought snacks at the park. He told me my biological mom was obsessed with mangoes even before she got pregnant and while pregnant she craved them even more. Just cool info to know even if it's random stuff. It's still stuff we have in common and we both have lots. We both like hiking, playing pool. He was a swimmer in college and I was on a swim team in high school. We both love rock music, especially 90s. My biological dad was really open about sharing everything, like he really was getting ready for this meeting. He hoped it would happen and he prayed every day to see me again because he had so many things he wanted to tell me. Overall, really good first meeting. I'm glad it went well. He's open to the idea of meeting my parents. After I told them about all this, because they definitely want to meet my biological parents again if I'm comfortable with that, obviously if my biological parents are too, Let's see what happens. I don't know how it's going to feel for me. They met each other before, before I was ever even born, but I never had them at the same place, so that'll be interesting. Me and my parents met up yesterday to have breakfast so I could tell them everything. My mom was so happy how it went. She actually cried too when I was telling them about both of their reactions. My dad was proud because he knew how hard it was the months after finding my biological mom and not really wanting to make contact yet. I'm really happy to have their support because it's hard not to feel guilty about wanting to know more about my biological parents. They gave me a really good life, so for a while, it's felt like maybe to them I'm showing them that it wasn't good enough for me and I'd rather have my biological parents. But they told me many times that they want me to do this for me and they know how much I love them, and I really do. Finding them and meeting them was hard, but it was so worth it to me, and seeing their reactions made it feel even more worth it. Still can't believe it sometimes. Is it just me or is somebody cutting onions in here? Wee. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.